Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode 309 of Spit and Chicklets, presented by Pink Whitney from our friends at New Amsterdam Vodka here in the Barstool Sports Podcast family. What is up, boys? The gang is back together. It's been a while. We have myself, G, the wit dog, and the world travel himself, Biztafa Columbus, all here. How are we doing, gang? <laughs> I'm actually, I, I like to be referred to as Pussy Muncher from now on. But please and thank you. I, he, paid, he paid a guy in Hollywood to write that joke, too. That was a good one. All right. <laughs> He's high stepping out of the gate right now. So how are we doing, boys? Well, first off, we got to, you know, give congratulations to, to the Wit Dog, Ryan Whitney. Welcome to the world, Wyatt Tyler Whitney. I know you gave a, a little address to the, to the troops on here a couple weeks back, but I figured you might want to say something for the rest of the folks who might not have caught it. Oh yeah, it's it's been it's been a wild ride. It's been the craziest three weeks. Everyone knows those first few weeks, you don't really sleep. You're just like in a phase or a fog. I think I said, but amazing. So uh, it's been. It, I mean, it worked out, boys. We took that time off right as he was being born. So I am so fired up to work again. Because let me tell you, like I'm a stay at home dad right now. I'm not like wired actually to, to 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 do that that well. I'll say but I'm doing my best right now and I'm getting better, but I still need the time to just chat with you fellas. You know, it's like everyone needs to catch up with their boys. And so it's great to be back. You put Biz, those, I have uh, many questions for you, Biz. Well, I was going to ask you, do you put those tits on that it filled up with milk? Like, do you ever breastfeed and take the, the onus off Brie? No, dude, but I am starting <laughs> to get a little uh, heavy in that section. I'll say I'm on a little bit of an intermittent, intermittent. Is that what it's called? Intermittent. Intermittent. Mittens. Uh, I'm on one of those intermittent uh, fasting programs. So I only eat from noon to 8 p.m. And you got to You can't just eat like I think I read online that like, you can't eat like a slob for eight hours, though. But I'm doing like a lunch and a dinner and I'm trying to just get this thing back in shape because uh, I could be breastfeeding soon enough. <laughs> a lot of too much soy. You're going to get those tits on you. <laughs> Taste That's that sweet milk. That's what happens if you drink too much soy. Ask R.A. Yeah, one one of my perverted buddies who who will stay nameless. When he he had a kid, he's like, my son would get on one and I'd get in the other. And our rule was just don't make eye contact with each other. <laughs> like they both breastfeed at the same time. Oh. Like no eye contact. <laughs> Fucking sick bastard. <laughs> um, Biz, Pink Whitney. How about these Pink Whitney Christmas trees we've been seeing? Huh? I mean, I, I don't know how you find a straw uh, tree strong enough to hold seventeen Pink Whitney bottles on them, but they've been impressive nonetheless. We we have some degenerate fans, and and first of all, G, great job with all the merchandise as well. I know you've been posting a ton about it, but uh, folks, if he hadn't been posting about it, El Presidente would have his fucking balls in a vice. So, uh, uh, oh yeah, I got to address that. I got to address that. We'll get into that later. Okay, what the El Presidente bullying everybody into t- tweeting? Yeah, out and all these some sales? of the comments. I come some of the comments I got from people online. So yeah. we'll address that later. We'll talk about that later. Oh, no, I'll talk about it right now. Yeah. I actually said when he tweeted that, I said, oh, I'm going to tweet something out. I had tweeted something, uh, Grinelli, we talked about doing it uh, at midnight or whatever, the night before. And then I did one then, did another one. And then he sent that. I was like, it's pretty legit. And that email, I didn't get that email. or I didn't read it. So I read he posted an image of it. And people are like, oh, you pussy. Oh, you gave in. I'm like, what? <laughs> trying to make the company that we all enjoyed work at working at like some money. I, I thought it was like valid. It's like pr- it, it, he actually said it. Uh, nobody got laid off in all this shitty COVID time. And, and then people are chirping me for posting uh, merchandise. Like you dummies We're trying to make money and help the company. So I was just shocked at people being complete clowns online. Or I shouldn't say I was shocked. That's normality. Uh, what else did you just mention about Pink Whitney? Oh, yeah, the trees, R.A. Are those – how are they getting them to balance on there? Is there wood under those trees? No idea. It's genius, though. It's however they're staying up because those aren't light. No, not at all. So I, I've seen a couple of videos of these kids just crush, crushing a bottle. They must be waffled, which check out those hockey jerseys, waffled with the Pink Whitney syrup going on. Maybe the best things we've ever put out there. Um, merch are. Uh, what else did I have for you, Biz? Oh, the headband. So everyone, I, I, I sign on. I signed on to Instagram, whatever that was, or go on my phone. When, when was this biz? Five days ago? And yeah, about first, four or five days. Yeah, Saturday. four or five days ago. I'll just go through the stories. I see, oh, Biz Nasty's got one. I got to check that out. I see Pussy Muncher. <laughs> like, in yellow and fluorescent pink. And I was just immediately started laughing out loud by myself. And I get on, he's wearing it again. 
I just need to know the backstory on that one. Well, okay, so I went to Cabo. I went on a couple trips during our break. I ended up going to uh, Page, Arizona on a couple hikes, and then we ended up going to, how do you pronounce it? Kanab, Utah? A lot of people were correcting me. I thought, it was K- I thought it was Kanab, Utah, but it's Kanab, I think it's pronounced. When, but then uh, for my second trip, we ended up going to Cabo, and we stay on the San Jose side. And when you get into Cabo, San Lucas, it gets a little bit rowdy. All these people are constantly selling you stuff. There's like thousands of these guys on the beach with all these headbands, like making fun of either Trump or Biden. And then this guy had one pussy muncher. He walked right up and I said, that, that, that thing's got my name on it. My old lady, you know, she, you know, she obviously knows I am a pussy muncher. So she says, Hey, here's five bucks. Make sure you put that on your head. And then we ended up meeting these, uh, this, this uh, lovely family. I forget where they were actually from. Cause I was so waffled on tequila and I actually got this nice, beautiful Jersey from him game worn Fire. so it, it, it was quite the afternoon is, that thing, is there a name plate on the back of that no there's not but speaking of Cabo Grinelli was actually there the week before that and he can attest to this that's like the one negative it's turned into such a tourist trap as you get closer to the downtown where we were eating at the office which is a, a pretty well-known spot to go to rookie move by me I greased the guy 20 at the front I'm like hey put us front rent, 100 front. biz jeez it's pesos no, no, 20 USD. Come on. That's like a million dollars in Mexico. So I said front and center there uh, at the beach. And then that, of course, the rookie move, because they got all these people nonstop filtering over. You guys, you want to fly to the moon? They're offering you cocaine 24 seven. It's like, I'm trying to enjoy a fucking shrimp appetizer, but I'll tell you what. Hold right, on, you so you went Jason. to, you, you went to Daytona beach in Florida of Cabo. It's exactly what it's turned into. But as I said, I stay on the San Jose side when I go right beside Cabo Surf. It's very chill, very relaxed. I have a family friend down there. They're, uh, I think it's called the Porto Los Cabos Golf Course, and they got a good good setup there. So I actually played a round of golf as well. It was a great relaxing trip right before I got into this thing. And uh, that, uh, that Saturday, I did the tourist attractions, and, uh, and th- that was enough for me. Is people can actually see you right now for the first time ever because this is the oh, yeah. first podcast we are ever posting full episode on YouTube. There you go. Get a good look at this beautiful jersey. He, six, he looks like six XL. I gotta get a setup. He looks like, like he's biz. entering the, the the fucking boxing ring right now. Like there should be some yeah. fucking tunes blaring with the headband, the fucking vest. Yeah, and a white trash bash boxing match in Daytona Beach. That's exactly where you went. I mean, it's probably a little cheaper too because it's Mexico. Cabo's wow. heaven. Cabo you, is absolute heaven. How did you hit him? I, uh, I I played okay. I actually had three pars in a row. I had a, I, oh, I, you know you know me. Those I are go net through birdies. My, I go through my hot stretches, and we'll yep. get into the sandbagger later because yep. we got to save a little bit of juice for the end of the podcast. But uh, it was a great trip, and I'd imagine you guys did. I mean, some relaxing on your own as well. RA, what were you up to during your break? Lots of R and R. Obviously, with no hockey on, no basketball on, I don't really watch the NFL as much. I caught up on a lot of streaming. Uh, I caught some great shows. I, I blogged about the Queen's Gambit on Netflix. It's been a, a sensation. It's been the most downloaded original series ever. If you haven't seen it, by all means, check it out. And then another show I tweeted about. It's on Apple uh, Apple TV Plus. Ted Lasso, starring uh, Jason Sudeikis of SNL. I put it on once and I just wasn't feeling it. You know, sometimes you got to be in the right mood. Maybe I just thought it was going to be something different. And then I went back to it and thank God I did. One of the best shows I've watched all quarantine. He's just, uh, he, he's kind of this Midwestern, like earnest guy. You're kind of waiting for like the other shoe to drop because it's Sudeikis and he always plays this kind of lovable goofball. But you realize, oh, wait, this is who he really is. And he's, he gets hired. He's a college football coach who gets hired to coach an English soccer team because uh, the owner wants a, him to drive it into the ground, much like uh, Major League, the plot of Major League. And you watch it. And next thing you know, you're five, six episodes in on a binge and you end it. And you actually, Paul, it puts you in a good mood after. Like, I know, like, I love the show Brockmire, but it's as cynical as anything, as funny as it is. When you watch Ted Lasso, you're done with it. And you actually, like, you're in a good mood. It just, it, it's just a, a very uplifting show without being really corny. It's, it's so, high quality shit. So one of those shows, it's one season and then it ends and it's all said and done? Well, no, it's one, one so far. I, th- I think they renewed maybe for a second and a third. It's funny. It actually started out as a, as a character to uh, promote soccer here on NBC. And then, it, I don't know, it kind of fizzed out. So NBC actually created the character. And then Sudeikis kind of, I don't know, adjusted it, tailored it, and they made a series out of it. And, well, speaking of, NB- speaking of NBC, and like G. Agredelli just said, we're on video. As you notice, my appearance is different. I figured I'd go back to my usual look in honor of our guest tonight. NBC's own Pierre Maguire. We got him coming on a little later. Boys, wait, how good was this one? 
Yeah, it's very, I'm very interested to hear the uh, reactions from this. We had some people right away that were excited. We had some people who weren't so thrilled. So Pierre gets into the fact that he doesn't know. He doesn't hear you, you haters. And I think that people enjoy it. He's been around the game a long time. We appreciate it. But you're rushing ahead quick. Biz, did you ever find yourself thinking, like, I wonder what RA is doing right now during our vacation? I was, yeah, I, was, I couldn't, I couldn't wait to to hear what he was up to. I was very intrigued, but like, not uh, shocked to hear. All right, you, give you me like change. a Tuesday, four p.m. scenario. The past three weeks, Uh Tuesday, four p.m. Well, assuming I was awake by then, uh, no. Um, <laughs> no, basically, I, you know, I'd slap up a couple blogs here and there if I was, you know, feel, feeling the need to or if I wanted to. But basically, just relax and I try to get a little more exercise. And I got a checkup okay. at the doctor. They said, you know, I knew I had to lose a little, a couple of elbows, and the doctor reminded me of that. So I got out. I started walking a little more, get a little more exercise, and I actually adjusted my diet. But yeah, basically, um, go out for a stroll, come back, uh, catch up on a show or a movie, and slap up a blog or whatever but yeah just r and just relax kind of recharge the batteries and not a boy you know all right What's you got to get into hiking okay i went on you a big hiking can trip get into hiking i'm t- yes i yes i do his believe lungs you. are no you start black. out you start out small you don't need to go on the ones where you're climbing a lot more so ones that are just like even through and i i treat myself on the end i pack a beer and a bowl and i end up at the end of the hike you smoke you smoke a, a bowl and you drink enjoy a beer and then you and then you end up hiking back and the key to this one too so we were going to some places that were i don't want to say they were tourist traps but they're popular hikes so you're going to see a lot of people there is we tend to go towards the end of the day so we do the the hike on the way out as the sun's setting and then we put the headlamps on and we hike back during the night. And it's a blast. It's a little bit more of an adventure. It's a lot more fun. And, of course, uh, I was enjoying some shrooms while I was doing that. We, uh, <laughs> as we, I said KNAB, Utah, but uh, Zion National Park was a park that we went to. Uh, and there was one specific one that was just, like, gorgeous. It was called Angel's Landing. And, that and looked I had amazing. A- yeah, it, it was awesome. I, I probably would have never done it if it wasn't for my girlfriend. And she, and she brought me there. And, and I, I'll tell you what, I'm going to become a full-time hiker. I went and got all the gear. I got the hiking poles and stuff. So uh, definitely something that I'm – and and also ran into a bunch of Spit and Chicklets fans who are big hikers. So You should uh, have like, had a bag on you with some merch, chalk, chucking it left and right when you ran into people. But I wouldn't have thought you would have seen many Chicklets fans at Zion National. Well, I did. I did have a bottle of Pink Whitney because I was going to keep hiking and at the top, wherever I ended up, I was going to post a picture with it. But I did run into one fan and it was the last bottle I had on me. So I ended up giving up, giving it up to him before I went on my hike. And God, I forget the kid's name. But uh, like I said, just made a lasting impression. (laughs) Hey, did you say you're you're you bring a bowl and a beer? Well, yeah, I bring I bring weed with a with a you should trademark that. You should trademark that bowl and a beer, and every kid with like Birkenstocks would buy that T-shirt. Okay, maybe I think you could make big money on that. We'll we'll start more merchandise, uh, G. Uh, You you can have more work on your hands here. And uh, you were going to chime in when we were talking about the merchandise. Quick, what did you want to say, G? Uh, No, I was just going to say that people can now see us wearing the merch on the YouTube because we will be on the YouTube full time. And Whit mentioned it briefly. We just dropped a huge collab with Men's League sweaters, so. 15 different jerseys for your men's league team you can buy them in bulk they're they're pretty fucking awesome there's some really cool ones so check those out barstoolsports.com the russian gas one was awesome but you know what they should have had the rocket the 10 and then on the other side just like an old granny one because like like i said it's tens or ones in russia not not gonna lie the girl on it got me going a little bit hard Speaking of Russian gas, that's the next uh, Tim Stapleton Russian gas is the next uh, Chicklets animation we have coming out. And it is fucking hilarious. So stay tuned for that as well. We got to catch up with him. Speaking of animations, I think we've had this conversation before, like, you know, top three all time. All right. And I'll send it to you. Who who are the, the, the hottest animated chicks that get you going? We've done this. Jessica Rabbit. Everyone runs away with quick Hollywood. Number one. A Lewis. Would you put Lewis Griffin in your top three? Lo- uh, Lois Griffin. Um, <laughs> no, I, I definitely. Her yeah. or Marge, R.A. Jessica oh, Rabbit. Fuck, not Marge. Marge no, Ma- is brutal. No, Ma- no Marge is a. She's a. Uh, she's a no- normie in the in the streets, but a freak in the sheets. At least if you pay attention to the Simpsons. I R.A. was gonna. Say, R.A. was gonna hair. call her a fox. I think. I think he's just Marge is a. Imagine how big her, her blue bush is. No, thank you. I'd like to go. <laughs> I'd put Lewis way ahead of Marge. Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the Toronto uh, Blue Jay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, Jessica Rabbit's an 
obviously no no brain in number one. But yeah, Marge, I think Marge is a, a minx under there. Uh, but then if you go into like the <laughs> secondary characters of the Simpsons, I mean, you got, you know, Lurleen Lumpkin, the country Western singer. She before she What about what about Marge's sisters? Would you go to would you do a two on one with them? No. Hey, we were about no. to get a we were about to get a cracking list there, a Seattle nickname list from <laughs> RA. You interrupted yeah, me. Like, he's got a hundred. He's like, uh, yeah, there was Gertrude uh, Richards, the wife of the he's Scottish like, farmer. Well, he's like, Let me check my Google history here. Yeah. Fucking you just dot com <laughs> animation series. No, just I'm not one of those rubber cartoon porn people. Those, those say whatever floats your boat, but that, that's never been one of mine. But yeah, oh, Betty yeah, Rubble. She's Sorry. another she's another cartoon babe too. Yes. Huh? No, but Biz, I, honestly, I, I didn't travel in, in November, but you you know, through your Instagram, I got to Vicariously, uh, Utah, just an absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous place to visit. As advertised, I would definitely like I can understand why people move there and uh I'll be visiting again. And Chris, I didn't know how how it's a six hour drive to Zion national park. So we'll be doing that again. Met some very interesting people as well. Like one guy, he, um, his daughter's graduating university. Uh, he's divorced from his wife, but he bought, uh, I think Bummer. the, it was a Ford Winnebago and he was, he was all about it, but he, he lives out of it. Now he lives in Atlanta. He's going to finish up working there. And when his daughter graduates from university, he's going to, he's going to just go off and travel the world. He was Does there. He with have f- money. Yeah. He's got some dough. He actually, all right. He, uh, he works at the studio in Atlanta and I, I hope I'm getting this right. With a I want to say Tyler Perry started it. Yeah. That's where and, he, he has a there's giant a lot of complex there. T- yeah. There's a lot of tax breaks and Tyler Perry for, uh, I'm sure most of you people know who he is. Uh, he, he, he started out as, as, as an actor, right. And then got into producing. Uh, he's an African American and he ended up buying property in Georgia that was once owned and had slaves on it. And he turned it into a studio and he's, I mean, if you Google his net worth, he's done very well for himself. So to, obviously, despite uh, the old slave owners and, and, and kind of get his own thing going, he has a studio there. And I believe all the Marvel movies are now made there. Yeah, there's been a ton of production in Georgia. Tyler's not living in the van, right? No, no. This guy, this guy, I believe, <laughs> works in okay, Atlanta okay, and might right. even work for, I... for that studio. But after that, he's going to go travel the world. And as I mentioned, the buddy he's he was with has been to 100 countries and and I tell you what, after experiencing what I did on that hiking trip, I can understand why people end up living out of a van and just kind of going on, on on the road forever. I mean, Tom Green just started doing it. And already to get back to you about the the Marvel, the the studio. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, George has been getting a, a ton of TV and movie work down there. They used to have the, the what well, they call them the tax rebates in North Carolina. Well, they did away with them. A lot of people think they're giving away to store to Hollywood. It's like, no, when you give these discounts or rebates or um, – What's the other word with subsidies, subsidies, whatever you want to call them. Basically, you're taking in money to your state that otherwise would not have been there. So if it's 70 cents on the dollar or 50 cents on the dollar, that's still 50 cents more than the state was getting prior. Well, North Carolina did away with that program. Georgia had one. And it seems like they've been making almost every TV show or movie that's been, come, that's been coming down the pike, including all the Marvel movies. So, yeah, huge part of the industry right now in Georgia. OK. And um, speaking of uh, areas in the country that are getting movie stars to come film movies i i I seamlessly brought that over to local news in boston is leo and jennifer lawrence are filming here you know i see uh, tweets where they are where they're filming people are going down with their masks on taking pictures all right have you been down there I have not. Um, they are wow. filming a movie called Don't Look Up. Uh, Adam McKay, the director, making He's also starring Jennifer Lawrence. No, because right now, if you go down, you're just hanging out with a bunch of college girls who drove down from Amherst trying to get a glimpse of Leo and Jennifer. And I mean, yeah, 25 years ago, I might have done it off. My wife had a gun to my head. But right now, under the circumstances, to go get a glimpse of Leo, nah. Now, if the, if the casting company calls and say they need an extra, that's a different can of worms. I'll certainly answer that call. But the company that I do have on file, like I'm on file with a place that you pay them a fee per year and they give you a heads up when there are casting calls. But uh, this particular company apparently isn't doing the extra work for this movie. So my phone okay. never rang, but see what happens. Next time. Maybe Leo's a listener. Yeah. Shocker. That's all. all right. Well, we know what happened after finishing up our summer in November, uh, as opposed to August, we're going to be kicking off the 2021 NHL season whenever it may start. Of course, when we last left here, we thought we had a deal, uh, but it seems like the owners, as best as I can tell, are going back on their word. They signed the memor- memorandum of uh, understanding back in August. Uh, now they want to rip it up and they want to make the players pay more again. Kevin McGrand of the Toronto Star, he wrote on, I think it was Monday or Tuesday, Bettman sprung the memorandum on the board of governors who unanimously endorsed it. It's believed some voted merely on Bettman's recommendation. Now, 
having subsequently read the memorandum after it passed, some are unhappy with it. And it's like, oh, okay. And then Tuesday, uh, Alan Walsh, the renowned agent, tweeted that the league is, quote, soft floating the idea that if there's no deal reached, it can affect cancel the season. And then use the Latin term, uh, force magier. I think you say it basically like, you know, the owners can say, we don't want a season. We're not going to have them, which in turn, Wednesday, Gary Bettman said, we're not having negotiations and we're not seeking to negotiate. But Alan Walsh, I mean, credit to him. He's the only agent I see out here, a, a person repping the players that's really kind of shooting down all, all the stuff. He's like, of course, it's a renegotiation. They don't like what they what they signed. And who knows what the owners were told back in August. But it, it certainly looks like they're backpedaling. And our pal Andy Strickman also tweeted, uh, there are some NHL players who have delayed plans to travel to the NHL city. Everything you hear and see from both the league and the players seems like we are destined for a 48 game season, mid to late January or early February start. The bottom line to me guys is the owners always hold the leverage just, and they could do whatever they want. And they could say the players, if you don't want to play, then don't and try to make them look like assholes. I don't know if you guys have talked to any of your, of your peers or your friends in the league with biz, if you want to chime in here. Well, people are definitely unhappy, and let me explain to you kind of what went down. It's, there's numbers involved, but I'll do my best to keep it, uh, what is it, layman's terms? Mm-hmm. So the players in the deal that they signed when, you know, when the CBA got going here and to, to get back playing, they, they agreed to, to, to have a 10% deferral for their upcoming year's salary. And it was going to be paid you know, years, down the, years down the line, but you're getting all your money. And the escrow was capped at 20%. So that, that's what they figured, right? And that was for 2021, and then it goes down until like t- maybe five, six years from now, I think, or f- three, four years. Either way, it, it decreases. So they came back. They wanted it to go where you have to defer 20% of your money, and the escrow goes to 25%. So they're keeping even more of it. Yeah, so then their other offer was the escrow was even higher. And, and so the players are like, whoa, hold on. Like, we, we already – came to this agreement so as a former player i'm thinking like you're so bullshit because you had a legit deal everyone agreed to it and you know for a fact that they they can do whatever they want because in the end like they they run the show biz how how many times do you have to see like it's going to go down the way they want it to go down they wanted a cap they got a cap and, and you talk about the NBA and what a great league. Look, there's no issues. They figure out their season. I see so many people like comparing the two. The NBA is, there's nothing similar. They make so much money on their TV deal. The, the NHL really requires uh, the gate and, and the concessions and the jerseys and the booze. And, and these owners are like, no, wait. I didn't, some of them didn't even like the deal to begin with. And now most of them are saying, well, we're done. And it sucks because it is unfair, but it's like, that's the world we live in. I mean, these, they're the billionaires, right? I, I, is there any other way to describe it? Yeah, no, they can definitely play the waiting game because some of these players will at, will at some point get desperate. And it just sucks. If I mean, I can't imagine if we don't see hockey this year. That'd be we just, will. 48 absolute, games season. Absolutely terrible. And I mean, who knows? Maybe Bettman's trying to save some money so he can keep getting those fucking sketchers. I mean, maybe he wants a, wants a couple new colors, or, or I don't know what he's thinking. No but, new uh, soles. There's some expensive new soles. Like they don't they don't make that rubbery noise. Yeah, he um, he's a businessman, and this sucks, guys. And I can understand. I can always understand both sides of it because there is a business to be ran. But it does sound like once again, the players usually do get the short end of the stick as far as these negotiations are concerned. What Gary's trying to say, at least in his latest statement, is the fact that like, okay, we can we can go as as planned on that deal we did negotiate, but there's going to be players five, six years down the road here that are going to be suffering for, from it. And also, there's no way that the cap is going to go up. If anything, it might even rescind a little bit. Now, who knows where that goes, but... Uh, this is yeah. This is a tough situation for for for, for the league once again. And uh, from from a from a fan standpoint, they're the ones who really lose, and that's that's what sucks about all this. And uh, I'm hoping that they can get back to playing here soon, and fans can get back in the building. Um, and uh, I don't really ha- have much else to say about it. I, do I we know? I, do we know I, if this vaccine starts coming out? It, could there be fans maybe in uh, like April and May, or no? I don't think the world gets back to normal till summertime, and that's me being. What about fifty percent though, or something? Like as far as capacity? Yeah, like 
like some places are 25 percent right now like once the vaccine is out and about and five months from now could it not be like 50 percent? i don't know well I, I suppose that depends on which cities and states you're dealing with because of the clusterfuck of this whole thing every state has their own rules about who can come in and capacity and all that shit so there's, there's really nothing you could do set across the board right now uh, I will say the owner's biz from the, again, the best I can read in my situation is that they made a mistake. I mean, they fucked up by signing this memorandum and agreeing to now, I don't know who told them what the situation was going to be when the season started or potentially started, but it's kind of funny. These guys are all billionaires and those who weren't born into the money, these guys probably cut a lot of throats on their way to the top becoming billionaires. And now they fuck up and the players aren't even trying to cut their throat. They just want to keep what they signed. And the, the billionaires like, no, fuck it. We want to do over. So, you know, I think we should be clear here that the, the players want to play it and they're not they're not stamping their feet anywhere. This is all coming from the, from the owners. So that's what sucks about it is usually the players get dragged into it. And it's always the fans saying, oh, we're the ones losing where it's like the fans don't care. They're like, figure it out. Millionaires versus billionaires where it's yeah. like I, it seems as if, though, as far as the NHL is concerned, at least in the last few negotiations, the players have always been very, very reasonable. And in this situation, the owners are looking like shit. And it kind of reminds me of the situation that was going on with baseball before they got going, where they kept reneging on whatever deal that they agreed to. So let's hope they can figure things out and uh, we don't need to talk about this. And we could talk about uh, um, NHL players challenging non-boxers slash boxers to uh We can to talk about bowling a beer. We talk oh, about bowls oh, and beers. We, we want to jump right into that biz. That's that's been the craziest. Well, I, I would consider that days. hockey news right now because I mean, a couple of NHLers are, are are challenging Logan Paul and Jake Paul <laughs> and whoever the fucking Ooh, rest of the crew is. We need this. Yeah, yeah. just to have tee it up, to, Barre. Yeah, just in case uh, people aren't familiar, uh, of course, Saturday night, Mike Tyson and Roy Jones Jr. fought a, an exhibition match. It, it actually, I got a, a lot of people turned out to watch it. And it's had a weird ripple effect. Um, ever since then, we've had some version of Evander Kane, Logan Paul, Robin Leonard, Ryan Reeves, who dragged our poor biz into it, uh, basically challenging each other. And it looks, gee, you're the youngster of the crew here. It looks like Kane really wants a piece of this Logan Paul, and uh, he might want, want to oblige him. Yeah, first he went at Jake Paul. Now he's going at older brother Logan. So, wait, you were saying we fucking need this in hockey, right? Well, th- those guys are... I've had my, I've had different opinions on them. I hated them. Thought they were the biggest losers. And I remember the older... Logan did something... I don't remember the exact details, but he did like a, a ridiculous stunt... At a, at, I don't want to. Uh, was it a sacred like uh, in Japan? Gr- he went to the or, forest in Japan. The a suicide, suicide forest. forest? Yeah. yeah, like that was like I was this this kid. This guy is fucking a c- complete clown. But they have dominated the world wide web and figured out they have millions upon millions of followers, and they're now becoming like a bigger deal, like everywhere. Boxing. I mean, they're they run YouTube, right, Granelli? You're telling me they're YouTube stars. Yeah, YouTube well, podcasting. They do it all. Okay, so Jake Paul fights Nate Robinson, who you could tell Nate Robinson had, I mean, I would, I would be just as bad. That guy had no clue what he was doing in the ring. He was, he was lost. Everyone's like, oh, he's an athlete. This kid was younger and bigger than him. And he looked pretty good, I guess, but he looked great because of the knockout where the dude, Nate Robinson, led his face right into his mitten. And everyone's kind of going nuts about him. I think he also fought a TikTok guy. So I think if you're going to talk about like Evander Kane, who's named after Evander Holyfield, <laughs> who's boxed before, would get get how that would go in the ring. I think Evander Kane would pound him. I think he'd beat the shit out of him. I'll hop in here. That Jake Paul's been training and doing a lot of boxing. He's actually like, if you talk to boxing boxing experts, they say he's like no joke. I think it would be a very good fight. Do I believe really? That- yeah, do I believe Evander Kane can pick it back up very quickly? And do I think that he would win? Yeah, I do think. I, but I also don't know if that he would actually accept that challenge. Although he has been saying on his podcast and has he's been, been tweeting, talking back to him. He, and stuff. he has. He's he, uh, Evander's done a good job of engaging him. Now, before that, it was uh, I, Revo obviously reached out and said that he was going to pound my face, and then he was going to move on to to yeah, Jake Revo, Paul. Leave him alone. I'm, I'm trying to enjoy he's retirement here, muncher. Revo. Although, listen, if if the money was right, I would consider fighting Revo in a rough and rowdy match. I would five, challenge five him. Hun- five hundo? 500K? Yeah. Oh, I'd tie my hands behind my back and let him pound my face in for 500K. Why don't you call out, why don't you with your following call out Logan or Jake Paul and you'll get 500K minimum. I'll pay you if it doesn't rat up to that and you'll beat his face in. 
Well, Bizzle like, want a boat taken I, five miles off. I, was, so I, I thought we were going to throw in R.A. Butterbean after him. I thought he was the toughest me- member of the fucking podcast over here. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but that I would say that fight definitely took a lot of the attention away from the Tyson, uh, the Tyson fight. But uh, they called as, that far as, as far as Revo is concerned, you know, I would kind of like to see him and Evander go at it in a rough and rowdy, to oh. be honest, because after oh. after uh, they'd kind of been going at it a little bit, then Evander Kane takes a shot at Revo and his brother calling him the 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 Reeves sisters and then all of a sudden the SJ SJ Warriors went absolutely crazy because it was a oh did he get he got in trouble for that ah you know yeah. they went they weren't they weren't happy about it so he was dealing with his own little fight there on the side but uh some definitely some interesting things coming out of this one I want to see Revo and Evander Kane fight off the ice because there is some definite bad blood there before maybe they move on and that Jake Paul went on to challenging Conor McGregor and whoever whoever else he get his hands on I'll say this if the money's right and this if this jake paul would even consider it fuck yeah i'd like a shot at the title put that on youtube grinelli sure. they're going after logan paul though they're now going after the older brother oh so okay he, yeah so he either was no he, no he didn't win he's he's defeated he's never won a fight before so now evander's going oh, after he's him. been in a fight before yeah he fought ksi which is the giant youtuber as well so he fought ksi they drawed the first time he lost the second time and now that's who Evander's going at now is the older brother of Jake Paul who just fought against Nate Robinson. Okay, so oh, so okay. is this is it is it me? No, I don't know a ton about boxing. I love getting the big fights, right? My buddies will tell me, hey, big fight tonight, you know, pay-per-view. But I don't know a ton. I'm interested in watching these dudes fight. Like Evander Kane and this kid, I think they would sell a million pay-per-views. I mean, maybe not a million. I actually don't know number wise, but I think it'd be a monster. And Biz, if you were involved, oh my God, we were, imagine we were hype. Imagine me as your hype guy. I'd be dressed as a pink Whitney bottle for three months. R.A. would be my towel guy for sure. I'll be a No, man. he'd be like spitting and rubbing his face with it and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even get the two, uh, the two not mixed up between Logan and Jake. So Logan's the older brother. He's the one who's already fought a couple of times. Jake's the younger brother who just beat up Nate Robinson and they're both in the fighting game. Okay. Well, welcome, welcome be, to the YouTube world folks. Uh, exactly. I would be very interested to maybe, maybe see a documentary on these kids, these kids lives. No joke. Cause how do you even become, they just started off with just making little videos on YouTube when early when YouTube existed. Yeah, basically they, uh, the Jake was a Disney star. Jake was on Disney and then Logan's just been doing it through YouTube. These kids have been documenting so smart, every dude. day of they're, their they're, life they're, for five years now, six years. They're calculated. These kids, right? every move they make is calculated that Logan Paul. He's a fucking smart dude. Yeah. I actually wanted to say, cause I was dogging what, what, what I thought of him before, but I did listen to part of the podcast and he sounds like, actually more humble and that than i thought like he very kind humble of, like i kind of actually enjoyed listening so we'll see but if you could ever punch his face and i'd still be the happiest person in the world biz all right but you have the torn acl right i got two all i got the one still torn the other one's fucked up i get i'd probably get my ass whooped in there but, i don't know uh, man if you trained and got let's pissed. get to, let's get me and revo in the ring for for one round i'll be just fucking running around just avoiding this guy I'd say when it comes to boxing and fighting, careful what you wish for. Somebody might oblige you and fucking send you off to exactly. never. Mm-hmm. Exactly. All right. Well, boys, we were just talking about hockey and money and hockey players and all that shit. And hey, you know what? It's more expensive now than ever to suit up your little ones to play the game. Maybe you need a little cash to make that happen. Well, whether you're looking to refi or if you're a first time home buyer, Cross Country Mortgage is America's crazy good mortgage company. Cross Country Mortgage combines a people-first mindset with a dedication to the fundamentals of mortgage lending, which results in a fast, easy, and stress-free home financing or refinancing experience. Rates are pretty much at all-time lows, and they may never get this low again. I just talked to my buddy Chris over at Cross Country. He said a whole bunch of listeners have already reached out to refinance, so don't miss out on the opportunity. Cross Country Mortgage can tell you within five minutes if they can save you a boatload of cash. And like I just mentioned, it's a great opportunity to take cash off of stuff you want or need. Those skates and shin pads, they're not cheap, man. And sometimes you need a little bit of extra cake. So if you can refi and do it, by all means, check out Cross Country. And don't be intimidated by the home buying process. It's not as complicated as you think. And there are some amazing benefits available for first-time home buyers. Also, if you have a lease coming up in the next 6 to 12 months, you definitely want to look into your options. Don't let common misconceptions stand in the way of you buying a home. 
Go to ccmlens.com slash NBD to learn more about your future home buying experience or to refinance your current mortgage. That's ccmlends.com slash NBD to learn more. Cross Country Mortgage, LLC, NMLS, 3029, www.nmlsconsumeraccess.org, equal housing opportunity. Like I said, by all means, if uh, you need a little extra cabbage to take care of the little ones with their ice time, equipment, whatever, by all means, check out Cross Country Mortgage. They're great at what they do. What's that's up, where, Biz? I that's, knew where, I was- uh, that's where McDusty got his mortgage from on his new pad in, in Edmonton. Everybody was just absolutely hammering on that thing online. What would you think of it, Wit? thought it was unreal i thought it was like just an absolute palace for the best player in the world i don't know it was a little white i guess the gym could have had more life to it that's what i would tell him when i see him you mean you mean the basketball hoop the, yeah the basketball well hoop. The, the ceiling wasn't high enough so you can't shoot from from long range yeah, but that's like what... where like the colors and the, or the paintings and the pictures and the fucking stands he should have stands in his basketball court People, people were comparing come, people it. would come watch him do the inchworm. They'd pay tickets to watch him do the inchworm warm, warming Pe- up. People were calling him uh, the uh, Bateman from American Psycho. <laughs> hey, all right. <laughs> they're, 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 everybody was posting the memes of that and, and, and the gifs or whatever the hell you call them. But, uh, man, this guy just Who wants decorated to decorated it? Well, hey, so remember, he had that uh, that little he, feud he, with he his contractor. So maybe the feud was the ceiling wasn't high enough in the gym so he couldn't shoot his long-range jumpers. Maybe that's why there was a little bit of a riff going on. So we'll have to send someone over there to break his legs uh, on uh, McDavid's behalf. I'm boys with his dad after the All-Star game. He's probably going to hate me now that I'm chirping his son's house. I, I said, though, Palace. That's yeah, a- very, very stock. It's, you know, it's, everything was either black or white, so it, it really jumps out at you. It looks like, like an old-fashioned chessboard or something. But fuck it. He wants to put me up. I'll stay there. Oh, you think? <laughs> <laughs> All right, we got some other news to, uh, to share with you folks. We want to send out big congratulations to defenseman Johnny Boychuk, uh, who retired after 13 NHL seasons, over 800 games, including playoffs, and, of course, a Stanley Cup with the Boston Bruins back in 2011. Uh, he's not officially retired. He's going on long-term injury reserve, but he's all, he's all done with the game for all intents and purposes. Uh, this is a guy, man, he, I believe a second-round pick. He paid his AHL dues with for four or five years. He didn't become an NHL regular until 25 years old. And, you know, as a Bruins fan who, who had the, the joy and pleasure of not only covering him but watching him, this guy was an awesome teammate, a tremendous player, just uh, one of those guys who it seems like every teammate loved the guy with. I've never heard a bad word about him. I've got to hang out with him a little bit during the lockout he was around. And, you know, summers before I'd go to camp, he'd be back in Boston early. And just, like, happy-go-lucky, always in a great mood. You knew as a teammate. I mean, not that I played with him, but you knew around the league. And guys would say who played with him, just do anything to win. I mean, you, you, you've you said it already. And I think his shot made him such a, such a presence out there. He would also hammer guys. I mean, he's beast beast block shots he'd do anything and it was weird to see how long it took him because um you know he wasn't progressing as 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 i think he or a lot of people thought he would in his early 20s and then i'm pa- i'm pa- almost positive he won the eddie shore award in the ahl as defenseman of the year in that league he you did. didn't just say that did you all right no i didn't oh, but that would have, that's right. nice that would have been an early not listening to you uh <laughs> repeat but i i think that after that Biz, you you could you could maybe not attest, but I think I I would get your agreement that that can change your whole game mentally. Like I just dominated. Like I have no business in this league. I'm the be- I was the best defenseman here. I can play in the NHL. And after that, he took off. And Boston, I think, uh, gave him a good chance. And then to do what he did with the Islanders, you saw Anders Lee's Twitter post about the guy. I mean, four awesome pictures or Instagram posts, whatever it was, and, and mentioning, you know, how much, how, how good of friends they were, how much he meant to him. So it sucks when a guy loses it like that. It, you know, it's, it's like that. It's like, a, it's like a, a, a lightning bolt strikes and boom, your career's over. It's, it's different when I think guys have the time to realize it's kind of ending and you're slowing down and all of a sudden this happens. He gets that news that that's a hard, that's a heartbreaking day for him. So I really thought of him just having, having gone through retirement and biz, you've told your story, but I've talked long enough. Uh, I don't know him that well, but congrats on a hell of a career. 
Yeah, it was emotional to see it, that uh, that tw- Twitter post of him explaining how it all went down. And um, yeah, like you said, an unbelievable career. Nice to see him get to hoist the cup. And uh, and you know, it's we we talk about it all the time. Like not a lot of guys get to go out on their own terms. And another uh, another sad case of a guy who couldn't. Rarely ever does it end the way you think it will. Ninety nine point nine percent of the time, it's all of a sudden it's it's over. I actually scrapped him when he was a Boston Bruin. When I was with How'd the Arizona, Arizona Coyotes, I think it was Send a it pretty to, even, even, even scrap. But uh, Send it to you know, Logan he, Paul. He, he, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. He had a lot of tools Speaking in his of bag. that, uh, TMZ Sports just posted an interview they did with Evander Kane. So I'll, uh, I'll play that audio for you guys right now. Who am I? I'm the guy that you're talking about on your podcast. So clearly, you know, you're using me to get views, to get subscribers, to get listeners. So you can pretend to, you know, you can pretend to not know who the hell I am, but I'm the guy calling out your little brother. You said your game. I'll take on any Paul brother. I don't care who it. I don't care who it is. Either one of you can get it. You guys can maybe play rock paper scissors. I don't know. Maybe you guys can fight each other. Whoever loses has to fight me. If you fight either of them, what is the outcome? They're both getting. They're both getting KO. The Wolf can good. I, I know. I know they think. I mean, he didn't even realize that hockey players drop their gloves when they fight. That just goes to show his lack of knowledge about anything involving sport. Biz, can he even do this under contract? If he get, <laughs> if he got hurt, he wouldn't get paid. Yeah, the most absurd thing about it is Evander Kane makes seven million a year playing hockey. So I would imagine that there's a, some liability issues there. So I, I, I don't think he can scrap him unless maybe it could happen in the off season. But I tell you what, that Logan Paul, after seeing some of these clips, these guys need a haircut. That is just pathetic. Yeah, that he went his original video of I'll take the mop on your head, and wash the floor with it was hilarious because he does have that. <laughs> Yeah, and I, and oh, my, oh you're saying say Evander oh, already chirped him about the salad? Oh, yeah, he already chirped oh. his salad quick. <laughs> it is brutal. Hey, we should hey, we should get a fucking uh, a, a fake uh, a fake uh, what do you call that? A toupee made up of that salad and put it on RA. He sounded a little dumb <laughs> at the beginning though because <laughs> it's like one of these. <laughs> you look like Ian Poulter. Yeah, that's Ian Poulter. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> Where'd you All get day. that? Oh, you got to wear that the Biz rest of the pod. got that for you in Cabo, didn't he? <laughs> yeah. Buy one, get one free with the punch, pussy munch of fucking headband. <laughs> you know what's another crazy thing in Mexico? You can get any type of drug over the counter, like Cialis, Viagra. Really? You, oh, over the counter. And then you absolute... said those people dealing, like just trying to get you to buy Coke, like that's the legal, like no, there's nothing. Definitely the way less stomped on in Mexico. By All right, what's the movie? The second, the second one stunk, but the first one, Sicario. 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 Yeah. Is, check Sicario tonight. Early Great morning. shit. Yeah, right, same right. Uh, same guy wrote um, Yellowstone. He's the same guy who wrote Sicario as well. Good shit. Yeah, by the way, we want to say thanks to our friends at TMZ Sports for that sound. Um, but got to love Evander Kane saying they're both getting KO'd either way. I mean, whether he can fight or not, he, he can certainly talk shit on fucking social media, and that's entertaining. That should be the headliner for the 2021 season is, is those two guys going at it. Um, what else we got going on in the hockey world, all right? Uh, one of the note, re- as far as retirements, I want to say on a personal level, congratulations to longtime Patriot Ledger sports writer Mike Loftus. Uh, he's he also retiring. Huh? Yeah, he, 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 sh- oh, he tweeted out guy. a Tweeted out a retirement uh, column today. He covered 40 years he worked at the Patriot Ledger. Uh, I'll tell you, I, I've been going to the press box for about 10 years now. Always a very friendly face to me in the, uh, in the TD press box. Never a diva. Super nice guy. Sometimes you get up there and people have egos or whatever. I'm from Boston. They don't want to talk to you. This guy always treated me like one of the boys. Just a, a perfect gentleman. A, a great guy who did his job. With little fanfare, even if he deserved it. So, Mike, I don't know if you're listening, but want to want to wish you congratulations on retirement and, and best of luck going forward. You're a great guy. I'm pretty sure it was, that was the first interview I ever gave was to Mike Loftus. Probably because actually I, yeah, I retweeted he, it his call. Like uh, it was in the summer one time. He'd always come to that Thursday night league. Good dude. Yeah, Long he actually, time he did that. He mentioned, Hell mentioned of a you. mustache on him. Yeah, he mentioned column. him in the article? Well, because he, the, the Patriot Ledger is basically a South Shore newspaper, and he was talking about how many plays he's covered over the years in the South Shore and how much, you know, how many good plays have come. And yeah, he gave the old Whit Dog a shout out in the piece. Oh, there, yeah. So. Tommy Sticks. Yeah, I yeah. sent him some merch. Yeah, absolutely. But don't forget about me, Mike, and you call him. 
congratulations. Great career. That's, that's yeah. I'll, I'll see him around at some point. Yeah. Great career. Great guy. So Playing enjoy Keno. time at Mike. Uh, while we were gone, there were some signings. We're not going to go over every nook and cranny of, of every little piece here, but we just want to keep people abreast. Uh, Ottawa added a pair of unrestricted free agents and uh, Alex Galchenyuk and Michael Haley. Uh, and then a bunch of RFAs re-upped with the teams they were with since we last met. I'm just going to rattle them off here quick, guys. If you want to chime in, jump in. But uh, Warren Fogle uh, for Carolina. Victor Olofsson. Fogle, Buffalo. I think it Fogle. is. Fogle. I, I was going to say that. Good there. enough. Anthony, good enough for Chicklets. Anthony Mantha, Detroit. Ryan Pollock, the Islanders. Ryan Strom in. Brendan Lemieux for the Rangers. Vladislav Gavrikov, Columbus. Mackenzie Wiega, Florida. Rupe Hintz, Dallas. Mikhail Sergachev, Tampa Bay. And Jake Debreska, our buddy here in Boston. So everybody re up. No, no crazy contracts. Nothing out of the ordinary there. But what was Sergachev's deal again? Sergachev signed a three year deal worth $14.4 million, comes out to $4.8 million AAV cap hit. Ding, ding, ding. That's, that's how you win a couple cups. Oh, I know. Are you Fucking shitting me? Fucking Tampa. Do you know the division, the Atlantic division, when that deal went down, or the whole league? They're like, are you kidding me? It, like, could it be two years, please? We got to deal with this guy for three more years where you're still able to pay all these other players because he's only getting over, a little over five. Sergeyev, after the playoffs, looked like he should be making eight or nine. Now, granted, he doesn't have the leverage yet, but what a player and what a contract. Uh... The other one you met. Oh, DeBrusque, happy for him. Now, that one was what, 3.8? Three, 3.8 eight? Three, eight per year? Uh, Jake, two years. Yeah, 7.35 comes to 3.675 per year. Three points. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the years he's had, like, he skates so well. He gets so many chances. At times, I think, like, Bruins fans, they get frustrated with everyone, but you hear them complain, oh, DeBrusque. But then you notice in the playoffs, he's been good. Uh, I just think that he's such a locker room guy too. We, we talk to him. He's just such, such a great guy to be around. That certainly counts for something. And it's, it's good to see him get resigned. I mean, they had to figure that out. They lost Krug. It's tough. I, I saw some McAvoy quotes saying how hard it's going to be at the beginning. Like it's the first time they've lost a really key guy to free agency. And it's going to be tough, tough, you know, shoes to fill. And you know, that that's, that's saying a lot going into a season, whenever it does start. But I, I, I digress from, from DeBrus. I'm happy for him, and I think that's a good deal. If he goes out and gets 25, like you know he could. Let me, let me ask you this one, guys. So with, okay. boy Chuck, with the boy Chuck news coming, do you think if they would have known that prior that the Taves deal wouldn't have gone down with Colorado? I'm going to say lose, lose way ahead of the game in terms of he's getting, he's getting updates and in, in, in knowing what's going on with – with Boychuk. Although maybe if the doctors hadn't told Boychuk yet, how would Lou know? Right. So that's kind of oh. where, where I'm fa- I know that was a little bit out of left field and we were talking about other signings, but, but Boychuk's uh, you- old and yeah, I think he, he, that didn't have much. To, it was, it was still a weird deal. Okay. Well, I'll just shut the fuck up over here then. No, no. A great question. It really got my <laughs> mind racing. I didn't even give chance and our chance uh, to RA to express his opinion. Yeah, I think it's a great bridge deal for Jake. I mean, you know, people were loving him after his playoff performance versus Toronto. I can't even keep track of years anymore, but a couple of years back. And yeah, he, he tapered off a little bit, but I, I think this is an ideal situation for him where he can go out, produce, get it done, and, and get a nice little payday at the end of the day. And what you mentioned, uh, the B's not coming back without a key player. They might not have Zdeno Chara as well. He hasn't signed yet. I don't know which way he's leaning. He's obviously going to come back for short money if he comes back at all, so... Uh, it's going to be interesting to see what the Boston blue line looks like next season, whenever it starts and for however many games they play. So obviously we'll keep tabs on that. Uh, we do have some COVID related scheduling notes. We want to pass along. Uh, unfortunately, this stuff is still with us, but just want to keep people abreast of what's going on in the hockey world. The world junior championship will take place in Edmonton and red deer shout out Rick. Uh, it starts up on Christmas day and it's going to run through January 5th. So we'll have some hockey to watch obviously before the season starts. Uh, there will be no bean pot here in Boston this February. Unfortunately, uh, BU, BC, Harvard, Northeast and the annual tradition tournament. They play the first two Mondays in February every year. Unfortunately, can't do it this year. Uh, the hockey hall of fame induction ceremony was delayed. Obviously that didn't happen while we were gone. Uh, all Qu- Quebec Major Junior Hockey League activities will be paused between the 1st of December and the 3rd of January due to COVID situation. Uh, the National Women's Hockey League is going to play the uh, remainder of their season in the Isobel Cup playoffs in a Lake Placid bubble from January 23rd through February 5th. 
Uh, there's going to be six teams with no fans in attendance and players could have opted out and still received their full salaries. And 95% of the players did opt in. No surprise there when you're talking about hockey players. So good spot there. It's unfortunate too, because that's a great place to watch a game. Uh, also, hey, did we got- you bring up uh, the world juniors in Edmonton and Rick and Red Deer? I did. I did. <sighs> I, <laughs> I can't imagine how much fun that would be for the guys if, you know, times were normal right now. Uh, but can you, can you just picture Rick and Red Deer, his wife asks him like, honey, wife? what do you want? <laughs> honey, what do you want for Christmas? And he's like, all I want is to be on the maintenance staff of the hotel where team Canada's quarantined. And he just goes in there and he's able to like fix the AC in some first round picks room. <laughs> like fuck creep them all out. He's skiing fucking Kirby Doc and whoever another stud forward is from from yeah from the he's team. like Kirby, what what happened with them sweatshirt were, were they late to practice uh, one day or something like that they got pee pee slapped they got to leave the, they got tossed out of practice he was teaching yeah. them all how to swear Just yeah they showed up late he... tried to walk on it looked like a little late and the coach was like nope that's all right we're still gonna get him on for an interview uh, a pre tournament here no bean now pot they, sucks. they had to they had to shut things down there because there was a couple cases and things ended up going a little bit rampant so let's hope that that tournament's able to kick off i know that's a, a big t- uh, christmas time tradition and and i'll say over the years it's it's grown in the states too you guys have put some very competitive teams uh in the tournament as of late with the u.s development program so uh it's never a guarantee for canada anymore no no oh. Definitely not. Definitely not. All right, moving right along. A couple of other news items here. Uh, Florida Panthers hired a new assistant general manager, Brett Peterson. Uh, he's a local guy who played at BC and in the minors for a few years, and he's now the front office pioneer. He became the first black assistant general manager in league history. Uh, like Florida GM Bill Zito, Peterson worked for the players before moving over to the front office. He's been a protege of Zito's for years. Uh, Zito took Peterson on as a client back in the day, hoping to get him to work for him. Uh, and that's exactly what happened. And now Peters, he, I'm sorry, Zito brought Peterson to Florida. So uh, congrats to Brett Peterson on uh, becoming a pioneer and, and smashing other sailing and becoming the first black assistant GM in league history. Yeah. Good and Brett see. Peterson and I, we played together on a team, the outlaws. Uh, it was like fall season before your high school year. He played at Cushing Academy. I was at fair Academy. One of the sickest skaters. This guy was awesome. Went to BC, Awesome player, defenseman. Uh, so I've known him for a long time. Great guy. H- hilarious to be around. Classic one-liners. And I didn't know that. Uh, did you say he took him on as a client, as a player, hoping that he'd work for him? Like he already saw that in his future? Yes. Yes. When he was really? playing in the coast years ago, Zito saw something in him. And he basically became his, his mentor, his, his protege. And, and now it's, just, it's come yeah, to so, fruition all these years so later. So Brett and, and Tuca became really close. Um, and I think that everyone knows he's going to do a great job. That's just an awesome honor for him to have. And he's, he's, he's a, he's a class, classy guy. I'll say that. And uh, the, Greg Wyshynski's article about him, I guess his nickname is Chubbs from uh, Happy Gilmore. Oh yeah. The Chubbsy. Happy Gilmore movie. Chubbsy. Oh, anytime you got a good nickname, we got to mention that. Like Chub- no. He's like, Chubbsy looking great tonight, boys. <laughs> Uh, also, we want to mention the Chicago Blackhawks hired Kendall Coyne Schofield as the first female development coach in team history. Uh, she'll assist the coaching staff at Rockford. So congrats to Kendall uh, as well on breaking another barrier in the sport because she made uh, her name known to those who didn't know it at the All-Star game a few years ago with her light and speed. So uh, she keeps creeping up the career ladder. So congrats to her as well. Uh, before we send it over the interview, wait, we got to acknowledge this anniversary today. Of course, it was on Wednesday, the 25th anniversary of Patrick Waugh getting pulled after giving up nine goals in an 11 to one loss. Just an epic scene comes off the bench, walks right past his coach, goes over to the team president, Arona, saying, This is my last game in Montreal. Walks past the coach again four days later. They send him to the former Nordiques as if the salt in the wound wasn't enough for the Canadians fans. Send him to Denver uh, with Mike Keane for Andre Kovalenko, Martin Ruzinski, and Jocelyn Thibault. The rest, of course, is history. He wins two more cups out in Denver, solidifies their, uh, their franchise as an up-and-comer. What great stuff from back in the day. I was sitting in the parking lot in Derby Street waiting for a Chipotle order. And I saw the tweet that I ended up retweeting. I'm sorry. I don't know the name. I, I, I check out my Twitter. I'll pull it up. Actually, I'll be, a, I'll be, a, you know, I feel like that's journalistic integrity, right? To say the guy's name. Absolutely. Yeah, I tried. Okay. Sid, 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 Sid,
Uh, he tweeted the video of the Red Wings snapping it around. The Habs lost 11-1. R.A. mentioned it. He allows nine. It was Mario Tremblay. Correct me if I'm wrong, R.A., the it coach? Was. You want to talk about a guy with an ego. <laughs> this guy, I mean, he was the show coach of the Montreal Canadiens. And to embarrass Patrick Waugh like that, who'd already won two for that organization. He'd already won two. He was still in his prime. He had 86 and 93. And to pull and to embarrass him at home and the Red Wings. Oh, my God. Larry Onoff snaps it around to Fedorov. Somebody replied with Fedorov skating out to the All-Star game looking <laughs> phenomenal. When we post this on YouTube, can you now, po- can you now put in that video? Nope, not okay. legally. That would be sick, though. <laughs> but just imagine it, folks. Okay, just, just imagine, imagine it in your brain. It's just a great reply. Fedorov burying, um, burying Wad uh, Montreal. So he goes by the coach. The coach is just game. He's just staring at him. Just fucking just dri- what is the word a uh, late laser through his eyes i can't even describe what i'm trying to say just hate hate in his eyes and he walks by him and then he decides oh fuck him he turns around he says and the president's sitting no glass back in that day <laughs> imagine uh, i saw somebody sent a tweet imagine um shanahan sitting right behind <laughs> <laughs> Keith. <laughs> no crazy glass. it's crazy so so he says i'm out of here well, boys, that moment, that changed 25 years ago today or tomorrow, you know, yesterday. Now you guys are listening to Thursday. That changed hockey history because it, it changed the entire Colorado Avalanche's uh, um, organization trajectory, right? He brought them their first Stanley Cup, and it's five months later. I said the next year. It was the next year, but it wasn't the next season. It was that season, and and – not only does that happen, and then they win the other one, and I mentioned in my tweet, Bork gets his cup. Patrick Waugh still at, still at the top of his game in 01. I mean, that's six years. Or no, excuse me. Yeah, six years after that deal from Montreal. Not only does, do they win the Stanley Cups, well, that rivalry with Detroit forms the greatest yep. rivalry. In my, I mean, RA is going to try. During that stretch of time, for oh, sure. Dude, those games. Oh, those my games, God. I remember the regular season game, February, like ESPN, A team there, fight off the draw on the one, just the history with the Lemieux hit on Draper, just everything. And it all started on that day, 25 years ago, when you embarrassed a superstar. You don't do that, especially to goalies. The- They're mental. With the, the rivalry game videos, whenever they were going to be playing each other, there would be yes. no goal scored. It would just be all the scraps, which na- nowadays is not allowed. And one of the funnier moments, though, uh, during that game when he ended up finally getting yanked and, and the rest is history is is after he let in his like eighth goal, he ends up like stopping a dump in. And then the whole c- crowd <laughs> chants, oh, and he's shit. putting his arms up, being like, yeah, 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 I got yeah, it. Yeah, fuck, fuck all you guys. I'm yeah. fucking out of here. Like my it. ball bag. I gave you two cups. <laughs> now I'm going to go win another team two cups, you fuckers. So uh, definitely uh, uh, one of the – probably the – one of the craziest moments in NHL history, the fact that the guy was even sitting behind. The only thing what made it better would have been if he would have took a sip out of his beer if he had hey. one behind the bench. And what, and what a way to go out. So what does that take me to next? What the fuck have the Montreal Canadiens done since that? Nothing. Um, Not much. 25 yeah. years, dude. They haven't done shit. And everyone who says the Montreal Canadiens is the greatest organization in the NHL, they won all those Stanley Cups. They just got every good player from Quebec. <laughs> I mean, hey, you're nasty. You're from northern Quebec. Come on down. Be a Canadian. Maybe not northern. Any kid in Montreal, they, they got them all. There was no draft. Of course they were going to win all those Stanley Cups. The other fucking teams had to go through. They had to draft players. They had to fight for everyone throughout the provinces. No Americans got a shot back then. So I guess you could compare it to when, uh, like, Boston. What, what was the, the old goat story? Isn't that what uh, the, well, ba- no, it was the Babe Bambino? Ruth. The course oh, the they, Bambino. They traded, the great Bambino. They, yeah, they traded Babe Ruth. The curse of the Bambino. So that's that's what you're comparing it to? Yeah, in the kind world? of. Kind okay. of. I think the Sox went... What did the Sox go, R.A.? Why yeah, did I get it's... the GOAT? Why did, why did the GOAT come to you my You might head? be thinking of the Chicago Cubs. Oh, yeah, yeah, I got it mixed up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, right, I can... sorry. Oh, R.A. I'm like sorry, business brain fans. filter. R.A., speaking yeah, thank of Chicago, you. I listened to the snake draft with the Chicago boys. Oh, yeah? Eddie's dog walk. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I want people to go listen to it. R.A., I, was, I mean, I had a good time listening to it. Some of your picks were so perfect, R.A., 
so perfect. I think one of the questions was uh, where you'd want to be in world history. At what moment would you, did you wish you could be at world history? And Ari picked uh, living with the dinosaurs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was the the dog walk. Uh, Bostel Eddie, awesome dude. He does a, a they do a snake draft. They've had a bunch of uh, us characters from Bostel on it. It was five events you wish you could have attended: one sports, one concert, one U.S. history, one world history, and one miscellaneous. Now, those guys, some of them, I think they're trying to like play to the audience a bit and get the the audience votes. Like I said, the White Sox, Dave. Like I don't give a fuck how they vote. I just want to pick what I think the best one is in the spot here. So okay. it, it was a ton of fun. If you haven't seen it or check it out, by all means, I, I like give it that. a listen. I want in on one of those. Oh, I'm sure they'll have you. It's, it's a lot yeah, of fun. To I do texted Eddie. So Biz, I picked for my, my concert. I picked the 1967 uh, po- uh, Monterey pop festival. I know everybody talks about Woodstock. Yeah. I would have said Woodstock. Monterey pop was in California during the summer. It had be- better weather, arguably better music. Well, I don't I mean, it was just three days of drunken, uh, drug and debauchery in, in fucking California. Mud. No mud, no rain, no running out of food. It was just a, a, a grand old time. Um, I know everybody probably thought I would have picked Bob Ewell, but I actually picked the Rumble in the Jungle, Ali Foreman in uh, uh, Kinshasa Zaire, one of the most epic boxing matches of all time. So I picked that yeah, for I like US, that one. U.S. history. I picked um, right after Prohibition was repealed. So when the whole country was getting Bender. drunk, partying. For world history, I took, like uh, which is said, being there uh, before the dinosaurs got uh, eradicated by an asteroid just to see what uh, you know dinosaurs are like. And my fifth one was miscellaneous, was to be there the first time somebody got stoned. Whether, whether they smoked it, ate it, however they did. Who looked at that, this bud on a, on a plant and decided to do whatever they did with it and ended, ended up stoned as a well, result? Those are some great answers. So you were, you were given time to think about these. Yeah, well, they do it. In advance, you had a couple of days, no? Yeah, Eddie gives you the, the, the you know, what the categories are. So I, I did some scouting, you know, and had my answers ahead of time. I actually was given the option of the first pick overall, which I know every whoever had it was probably going to take the miracle on ice. But I says, if I take that, then, you know, I ain't going to pick again until like the 10th pick. So I actually took the fifth and sixth pick. And granted, none of those guys probably even heard of Monterey was- Pop Festival, but. I, I had to take it. I was thinking about uh, sporting moments because obviously Miracle on Ice was, you guys all said, it was no no question. That's where, you, that's, that's where you'd want to experience sport was. To be in the Canadian locker room in Moscow after Henderson scored and was it 72 biz? Is that the Summit Series? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I right over my head. Yes, I believe and it was And you're 72. Canadian too. You should be embarrassed. Oh, buddy, Th- my history, that- pathetic. That would be that would be a moment in time to be that would be pretty sick. Or in the locker room when Gretzky got uh, five goals to get fifty in thirty nine games. Is that good? Yeah. Good stuff. All right, boys, yeah, check I it out. It's check it out. Almost time to send it over to Pia Maguire. Uh, just one thing for us. Today's interview was brought to you by Boykies. Boykies makes the most delicious air dried beef called Biltong. Think of a healthier version of jerky with thirty percent more protein. Boyke's Biltong is often compared to a tender and flavorful slice of high-end prosciutto with ingredients that you can pronounce like red wine vinegar, toasted coriander, rosemary, and salt and pepper. Boyke's Biltong is a snack you can count on to fill you up and not bring you down. Made in the U.S. with USDA bottom round beef, Boyke's takes pride in making the most portable high-protein power snack. Think of each two-ounce package as a perfectly seasoned five-ounce steak. The only preservatives they use are vinegar and salt, and compared to most jerky, Biltong contains half the sodium and zero sugar. You can buy Boyke's Biltong on their website, www.boikeys.com, and Amazon. Use the promo code BIZ25, not BIZ20, BIZ25, because you're getting 25% off your first order. Follow them on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at eatboykeys and support our buddy Timmy's excellent snack. Boys, when we were in Charlestown, how many pounds of this stuff did we go through? I love dummy, it. Dummy it. Dummy it. Dummy it all week, all month, whatever. And going back to that uh, that snake draft, I think, I think I'd want to go back to when, like, like the whole Jesus thing was going on. Uh, someone said that. R. Oh, R. Right? did they? Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Already got straight. actually mad. You got mad already a little bit. Oh, at White Sox, Dave? Yeah. Yeah. Well, he try he does that. He tries to change the rules. Like he he said, oh, this is like if you were a fly on the wall. And then he tried to pick going back in time and preventing the coronavirus. It's like he was bullying this guy, Biz. It was unreal. On his own show. On his own show, he was just giving it to him. 
Yeah. So he well, picked he picked going back to what see Jesus during like the resurrection no, stuff. No, what White Sox Dave picked to, to stop the Corona, but no, Kyle picked the resurrection, and I busted his balls. I saw we're doing fictional events now, you know, like oh, he didn't take dude, that, yeah. well, that's why I was I was oh, nervous saying it because now I'm gonna get all these atheists after yeah. me for crying out loud. No, and he, they asked R.A., "Are you an atheist?" No, I, I told him I'm an I'm an Irish Catholic from Boston, but if you know the history there, then you understand why I'm not too keen on the old Catholic Church these days. So I'm not, I, you know, I feel like I I went yeah, through that, so I can make fun it. of it, and yeah. I'll take the heat because I don't give a shit. You know, I, I grew up in that environment, so I can make fun of it. So either way, I, it was fun, man. And now, with yeah, I'll, I'll tell him to oh, play you on. How about this answer? The fucking Coliseum. Oh, oh shit! To see it. Did anyone um, say the Coliseum? No, no. no. Oh, to see I a, just won. To see a gladiator thing. That's a good pull, bit. Front oh, row seats. Shit, Biz, you just won that draft. I know. Fucking front right. Row, hey, front row seats to see him go like. Patty see, Wall uh, walking by me, fucking sipping on my beer because <laughs> he's pissed off. He didn't get yanked after the lion bit his face a, off. Giving a thumbs down to his coach right in front of him. <laughs> <laughs> the team president <laughs> sitting front row for my limbs getting ripped off. <laughs> Hey Caesar! Hey Caesar! That was my last. That was my last go in in Rome. I'm out of here. Send me to Florence. I'll fight a fucking lion and a and a, and a giant snake. <laughs> Fuck! Hey, you know what? Hey, how about this one? Adam and Eve. Ooh, shit! Imagine their sex though. It'd be just oh, terrible. Gross. Oh, oh those, everywhere. Talk There's about Marge's bush. Mundo cheese. <laughs> wow! Disgusting. Holy we God. went off the rails. No, let's go to fine. let's go to Pierre. Pop rock off course. The rails. Absolutely. We tried to grill this guy, but he he stayed firm. Yeah, he didn't want to get canned. Fuck! I know. He's just hey, this guy's a machine. He doesn't hear any of the hate. He's been doing it for years. Let's go right now, Pierre McGuire. Thanks for joining the show. Well, it's a pleasure to bring on our next guest. For the last 14 years, you know him from his work on NBC's NHL telecasts after several years at TSN up in Canada. Prior to his media career, he served as an NHL scout, assistant GM, head coach, and in 1991, he won a Stanley Cup as an assistant with the Pittsburgh Penguins. He played at Bergen Catholic High School in Oradell, New Jersey, then for the Hobart College Statesman in Geneva, New York. Thanks so much for joining us on Spit and Chicklets, Pierre Maguire. It's awesome to be here. I can't believe, Ryan, you look so young, and Paul, so invigorated. It's awesome to be with you, gentlemen. <laughs> you really mean that, though, Pierre? I do. What? I do. I wish I had the same flow, Ry, as you do. Yeah, my flow, my Brillo pad. I will say, everyone says I looked like I was 53 when I was 20, but I still look 53 at 37, so I don't work. I I, I don't like standing next to Biz. He's always got that glow on. So, Biz, I just got to take you down this. My my relationship with Ryan Whitney goes back to when he played at Thayer Academy. He was a freshman there, and his defense partner was Brooks Orpik. So that just just to date us. To show, and I'll never forget when he was drafted fifth overall by your Pittsburgh Penguins at the time, and I'll always remember that. So yeah, I go yeah. all the way back with Ryan. I you know that. where everyone played? It's absolutely insane. We'll get into that later. That was 1998 for everyone wondering at home. Actually, the year before I won the Quebec Pee Wee tournament, in <laughs> it was still a hell of a run. Thanks for bringing it up. <laughs> so, Pia, hey, how I was going to ask, if we yeah. quizzed you, would you know where everyone played junior or college, you think, in today in the I NHL? you played for two junior teams. Okay, let's hear it. Well, one of the last one was Owen Sound. I know that. Well, technically, Pierre, I played for three because I went from North Bay to Saginaw. I was oh, there the last nice. year. Oh, stump the chump, kicked, baby. Then he got kicked out of place. I should have yeah, put, put North Bay in there before he went to Saginaw. Yeah. So, Pia, how are you decompressing after the longest season ever and all that time in the bubble? Um, you know what? It's been great. My son's playing junior hockey in British Columbia, so I was getting all the great pictures from my wife as he and my son, or she and my son took this cross-country trip in Canada, which was good. So that helped. My daughter's a sophomore at Dartmouth, and she's not on campus right now. So I've been fortunate enough to have her home, and I'm actually helping train her. So that's been good. And when I have a little bit of time, I've been golfing too. So that's been a ton of fun. Nice, nice. That's good to hear. Are you still living in Montreal? No, we have a home 100 okay. miles north, Ryan, in Montreal. But we sold our home in Montreal 11 years ago and moved to Connecticut. That's how long ago I was at your house for dinner. Mark Recchi took me over. Jordan Stahl, Sidney Crosby you were nice enough to host us over there. I remember that. But I guess that's that's dating myself. Jesus but Christ. You know what, Biz? I got to tell you this story. And you guys, too, you'll like it about Ryan Whitney. He's a fa fashion. Ryan Whitney, uh, boys. 
fashion aficionado. And we're sitting around the table at our old home in Montreal. And there have been some pretty good stories told around that table. Brett's has told a few and Rick Tockett's told a few and Scotty Bowman's told a few, just name dropping. But we're there and Sidney Crosby sitting at the table as a young kid. And, and Ryan Whitney says, why don't you tell him about your house? Why don't you tell him about your house? And Sid goes, what do you mean? He goes, well, you bought a pink house. You have a pink house. And Crosby was calm, cool, and collected. And finally, at the end of the dinner, he goes, Whit, my house isn't pink. It's salmon. And Sid was angry. <laughs> was he pissed at you, Whit? I forgot about that. So I always said he had a pink house, and he would really argue it was salmon. And then that night, he didn't give it back to me right away. But I think saying it enough finally grinded <laughs> his gears hard enough. Pierre, when you came on the scene for me and I just talked to him yesterday was when uh, Dion Phaneuf was playing World Juniors and you've token the phrase, double Dion. Tri <laughs> Sometimes you'd even drop a triple Dion. Do you remember who get... he ran over? Uh, I no, don't, I, I don't, don't, but it was a Russian. It might have been over your mouth, and I don't know. But it was a Russian for sure. Um, he and Shea Weber were a dynamic duo on the back end for Canada in that World Junior. That was 2005 in Grand Forks, North Dakota. Um, but Dion was great. You know, I'll tell you, this is a great Dion Sid story. Uh, when Sidney was 17 in the 05 World Juniors draft year, there was an indoor practice facility in Grand Rapids, but it was underground. It was deep. It was about three floors deep. And Brent Sutter, the practice got so intense before the first Canada game that he had to stop it because Fanuf and Crosby just trying to, kept trying to kill one another. It was unbelievable. There was no media there except for my partner, Gordon Miller, and I. But it just speaks to the intensity of both Dion and Sid at the time. Two alphas that are playing in different leagues, and they're like, fuck this. Like, we'll be teammates <laughs> in about a week. This, this practice is game on. <laughs> Pretty much. Well, Pia, you were quite, looks like quite the uh, high school athlete here doing a little research for the show. A multi, a multi, uh, spit it out. A multi-sport athlete. Well, I was uh, when I came down from Canada to go to Bergen Catholic, it was actually to play football, not to play hockey. Uh, I was really fortunate. I played for a living legend who I talked to just yesterday, by the way, Tony Karsich, one of the winningest coaches in New Jersey high school football history. Um, I was so fortunate to play there, and, and the people that I met are still some of my best friends in sport. Um, you know, we lost two of my teammates. It shows you as you get older, I'm almost 60. We lost two of my teammates over the course of this year, which was really unfortunate, but those guys that I graduated with and played with there, I'm really, really proud of them. I also played football, hockey, or baseball and, and hockey there as well. So I was fortunate. I loved that school. It was an amazing place, Bergen Catholic High School in Ardell, New Jersey. And they still keep popping out amazing athletes there. Yeah. I, I played with a kid, uh, one of my good buddies, roommate freshman year at BU, Brian Miller. I think he went to Bergen Catholic. He did. He's a you got that spot on. Yeah. yeah, he was a – oh, this kid, Biz, he was one of those defensemen that – like nowadays he would play in the NHL. He was five, I don't know, 10, like just skated so well. He got hurt in college, but Bergen Catholic, we always used to tell him that's a football school. That's where they just roll out sick recruits every year. Pretty good. Yep. So Pia, after, um, after college played hockey there, what, what was your next step after that? I know you, you tried out for the devils with, and then you went overseas. Take us through that journey. Yeah. Uh, right after I graduated from college, I was signed by a team over in Europe. I went over and played there for a year and about halfway through that season. Um, I don't know how New Jersey, New Jersey saw me play and I signed with New Jersey, came back and uh, shacked up with the team, never got in any games and then went to training camp. And back in those days, there was a rookie camp. And if you were good enough at the rookie camp, you made the big camp and, then you kept going and got to play in some exhibition games and things like that and stayed right to the end and got sent to the minors um, right near the end of camp. And I knew at that time that uh, Marshall Johnston, by the way, was the guy that was so great to me there, along with David Conti, two phenomenal hockey people. And uh, Marshall just said, we see you as being more of a minor league player than an NHL player. You're more than we'd love to have you go play for us in the minors, but I did not go. I started my coaching career right away and, Six years after I left camp, I was coaching in the NHL. How'd you get? How'd you end up climbing the ladder so fast? I mean, next thing you know, you're assistant coach, and then you take over for who, who'd you take over for? Holmgren? Yeah, that was in uh, Hartford, but I started Correct. in Pittsburgh. And I'll tell you what happened is um, I basically married the game. Uh, I lived, I slept, uh, ate, uh, I skated. I was in the rink all the time. And Ryan will remember there used to be a real top end program in Boston called the Europa Cup. And uh, we had players like Tony Amonti and Keith Kachuk and, and uh, Jeremy Roenick, really elite players, uh, 
go through there. Bobby Kellogg, who was a third round pick of, of uh, Chicago. I can go down the line. It was a Sean McEachern. Didn't played, Brian uh, Leach, Brian Leach, probably Brian Leach too. was there hundred percent. So because I was helping run that camp in Boston and it was a whole summer thing. And during the winter, I was coaching and recruiting all over North America. And then I got a chance to go to St. Lawrence university and we had real good teams at St. Lawrence and then uh, Scotty Bowman saw me and met me and interviewed me, and the rest is history. That's how it so, happened. Biz, he's I, you. You're kind of not giving the whole story. At least what I've heard is Scotty Bowman. Were you running practice or some at some point where Scotty Bowman had a daughter at St. Lawrence, or he happened to be at St. Lawrence and he went in the rink randomly and he like really liked how you were running practice? Is that true? That is true. That is a true story. His daughter Alicia was actually recommended to go to St. Lawrence by a legendary hockey coach, Mike Keenan Ryan. And uh, Mike was oh, Mike, and Mike? Martin. Mike Keenan and Jock Martin were teammates at St. Lawrence University in Canton, New York, where Jordan Greenway, by the way, who plays for Minnesota Wild, that's where he's from, Canton, New York. And uh, Scotty watched the practice and he said, man, I love what you just did there. If I ever go to the NHL, would you come with me? And I said, yeah, are you kidding me? And uh, about four, we talked a lot. Back then there were no cell phones and I would be on the phone with Scotty sometimes till 12, 1 o'clock in the morning, just watching Western games and breaking down strategy. So that's basically how I got my start, Ryan. You're spot on. Was nice. video a big thing back then? It was for us in Pittsburgh. It wasn't as big around the league as it is right now. I'll never forget this. Barry Peterson, who does a great job on Boston Bruins TV, uh, was one of our players in Pittsburgh during the 1991 run to the cup, Paul. And I'll never forget him coming up to me after one of our team meetings. I ran this thing for the late Badger, Bob Johnson. Uh, it was a breakdown of our next opponent. And he grabbed me, and he pulled me aside, and he said, guys like you are going to kill the game. And I said, you know what? I agree with you. It was just we were getting to the point where we were oversaturating the players with information. And it wasn't just verbal information. It was visual information as well, Biz. And I think, you know, that was really the beginning of it. The 91 and 92 Penguins are really the beginning of video. Wow. Pia, uh, Biz brought up the Hotford stint. You were only 32 years old. Now, that'd be young for today, let alone way back in the day. What was your level of nervousness going, nervousness going into that, or did you have any? Oh, I, I wasn't nervous at all because I knew the players. Um, I knew it was a rebuild. At least it was supposed to be a rebuild. I left Pittsburgh to go to Hartford because Brian Burke was going to be the general manager and Paul Holmgren was there, somebody I really appreciated and respected for the way he played and the way he coached. And Kevin McCarthy, who's now in Washington with Peter Laviolette, he was the other assistant. So I wasn't nervous at all when, when Paul stepped aside and Brian left to go work for the NHL because I, I thought it was a five-year rebuild when I left Pittsburgh to go there. Little did I know that after two years, the team would be sold and Brian would have left. Paul was – uh, you know, going between managing and coaching. So it was a different situation. But no, I wasn't nervous at all. Unbelievable. I know things maybe not were ideal. I know some of the players that, that were there, were, you know, had some things they said to the media. Were there any lessons you took from that experience at, at all? That yeah, you we, kind we, of had one, we had one instance that I think really put a runky wrench into the whole situation. We had some players go out in Buffalo after a real disappointing loss in Washington two nights before. And um, maybe there was some miscommunication, maybe there wasn't, but uh, six of them got arrested and <laughs> some of the assistants got arrested too. And uh, oh, that goodness. wasn't very good. So that there was some miscommunication there. And I think if I had to do it over again, I was kind of on an Island by myself. Um, we would have probably handled it a little bit differently as an organization. I would have handled it differently as, as a coach with the media. Pierre, uh, Sean Berg came on and told the story of, of course, you knew Yager had an illegal stick. I don't know if it was for specifically the power play or something. And it was late in the game when you guys were back at Mellon Arena and you called the illegal stick on him. And then Yager ended up coming out of the box and scoring and then giving you the middle finger when he went by. Mm -hmm. That's a true story, Biz. Um, and it actually happened in Hartford. And, and Sean was Hartford. our really, we, we made this tremendous comeback against the Penguins. And it was an amazingly emotional game. And we tied it up late. I think Patty Verbeek might have tied it up late. And I, you know, obviously had coached Yager. I had been part of the management team that had drafted Yarmir. So I kind of, and I skated a lot with him when I was an assistant coach because you couldn't get him off the ice. So um, I knew he had an illegal stick. And I went up to one of our cap. I think it was Pat, actually, Pat Verbeek. And I said, tell Kerry Frazier. I think it was Kerry who was refereeing. We want to measure a stick just before overtime because we had tied it up. And it was illegal. And. 
Little did I know that Larry Murphy would do his virtuoso high flip pass out of the zone. Yager would come out of the box, get it out of midair, and go in and score the breakaway. <laughs> and he did give me the nice little salute as he went <laughs> off the ice. That's the real Yager salute right that, there. That was the real Yager. It wasn't this. It was something else. But he, what a phenomenal talent. And I'll tell you what, everybody talks about how great he was. If he would have played in this league with no red line and zero uh, tolerance and obstruction, that guy would have shredded numbers. He would have just shredded it. It was unbelievable how good he was. What about those few years where he kind of, I don't know, I guess maybe he's not giving his best effort. I mean, you would think he might have been maybe one of the top five greats. I know as far as games played and goals scored, but it, does it feel like maybe he could have done a little bit more as good as he's been? No, because it was tackle football when he was in the apex of his career. And, and I don't know how it's the same with Mario and, and Ryan knows because you and Paul, you know, too, when you're around Mario Lemieux, you know how great he was and, and is. And, uh, you know, Gret's the same thing. Just tackle football impact of the game back then. Star players just had no opportunity to do very much. And they were tackled. I mean, you could tackle a guy and there was no penalty. He was unbelievable. Back in those days. So I, I, I think Yarnberg squeezed every ounce of athleticism he could out of his body. It's amazing be- looking back yeah. now, I think, when you when you see people wanted to keep the red line in the game. Like It's so much better now without it. And, and just to look back and think of how slow it was compared to now, it makes a lot of sense. I, but I I'm, got, I'm cut- I Go got ahead. crushed on that, by the way, Ryan. I think you know that. I was one of the real – at that time, I was just starting my media career out. I started that and probably – calling for it in 1999 because we were in the dead puck era. We, we, I'll give you an example. In 2004, this is an amazing story, but in 2004, the Calgary Flames played the Tampa Bay Lightning in the Stanley Cup final. It was a great final. It went seven games, and it was back and forth. It was really good. You had a Gimla fighting with Cavalier. You had all kinds of stuff going on. It was really, it was a great Sutter versus Tortorella, really intense coaching matchup. But here's the thing. If you got the lead in any one of those seven games, you never relinquished the lead. There was never a lead change once in seven games. And that's because the red line was in and it was tackle football from the hash marks down on the goal line. Is that true? The team who scored first never gave up the lead? 100%. <laughs> wow. And then it was all changed. And I remember the, yeah, the year, or a year or two after um, the hockey came back, I saw that game or that series, one of the games on TV, it was like a different sport. It was nuts to look back and think it was only two years prior. So I'll just tell you this quick one about the red line. I'll never forget it. Cause my partner in Canada at the time, Gordon Miller and I fought tooth and nail to get that out. And a lot of old hockey people were really mad at us. And there was somebody that still works in the NHL hockey operations office now said to me after they got that pass, he says, you better hope that works because if it doesn't, you're done. That's what they told me. He said, you better hope that works. I said, oh, so I better work. Well, you're going into the media career and that side of it. I mean, and, you know, you got out of coaching. You weren't involved there anymore. It's not often you see somebody then goes into being in TV or as long as you've been. How did that all begin? What was the origination of you being on TV? Is origination a word, Biz? I don't know. Usually it's You're not talking it up the, the words. Let's so go with it. Let's You're welcome. With you can it. wear this one. Pierre, How did what do it all start, Pierre? Um, well, it's a good story. I was coaching St. Louis's farm team down in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Mike Keenan and Bob Berry actually hired me to coach that team in Baton Rouge, and I did, and I loved it. And One of the guys that played for me there was Shane Knighty, um, and I pushed Shane as hard as I could to get him out of there. And Eventually, he found his way up and made it to the National Hockey League and had a real nice career, so I'm really proud of Shane. We had some other young men there that played really well and eventually made it up to the AHL and the IHL. But yeah, Mike and Bob put me in there for one year. I really enjoyed it. But during that year, I got a call from the Montreal Canadiens and it was a legendary um, media man in Canada by the name of Ted Blackman. And Ted said to me, listen, we have some of the tapes of when you coached uh, doing interviews, either pregame interviews or postgame interviews. And we think you'd be really good at being a color analyst. Would you have any interest? And I said, I don't know. I really like coaching. I like being around the game. And I still think I have another run in me as an NHL head coach. And he says, well, when you're in Montreal over the summer, why don't you stop by the studio? So I did. And they gave me a test. And at the end of it, they offered me the job. And I called up uh, St. Louis and I said, I'm going to take this job. And I did. I took the job. And uh, I'm forever grateful. Ted was amazing. He passed away about 12 years ago, but he was an awesome guy. He really helped get my career going. And Gordon Miller, Bob McKenzie, Dave Hodge at TSN, along with Keith Pelley and, and uh, Rick Chisholm. I'm really grateful for the people at TSN and what they did for me. And, and I'll always remember that time at TSN. It was a phenomenal experience. 
So your name's popped up for a few GM jobs. Of course, you just mentioned you'd like to get back into coaching. That fire obviously still burns. Are you going to keep trying to get back in as far as management position or coaching? You know what, Paul, it's interesting. I don't think you ever apply for those jobs. People usually search you out, and that's what's kind of happened in my situation. I've never applied for any jobs. Uh, Owners will call you. uh, Managers will call you. Presidents of hockey operations will call you. Uh, friends that you know that might own teams in the league might call you, but I've never applied for any of those jobs. I'm, okay. I'm really happy doing what I'm doing. Um, you know, there's some that were really intrigued. I'll tell you the truth. Uh, I was a runner up to Mark Bergevin in Montreal. That was heartbreaking. You know, that's my hometown, but uh, Mark's done a good job. It's taken a while to get it back on the rails. Probably the suits. I think he, I think he wore a better suit to you than to the, or interview, the bi or the biceps. Oh, oh yeah. I already, yeah, yeah, he he squatted you. Shredded. He and then the other one, and I think both of you being former Penguins know, um, it came down to Jimmy Rutherford and, and myself for the job before Jimmy took it. And uh, I was really interested in that one. But I've, I've had some other opportunities at jobs that maybe just didn't fit properly. But uh, we'll see. But I like what I'm doing right now. I really enjoy it. Pia, was media something you thought about back in college or even during your NHL career? Or is it just a happenstance the way it happened? You just described, just described. I, no, I never thought about it. Not once. Honest to goodness, I never thought about it. And when Mr. Blackman called me up and asked me to come and do this test, I said, okay, I'll do it just because I was intrigued by it. But I had never even thought about it at all. I thought I'd do Montreal for one year and go back and start coaching. And I was actually offered an assistance job um, after my first year on in uh, Montreal on the radio. And I turned it down. I just, it wasn't the appropriate job for me. And I'm glad I did because all those coaches two years later got terminated. They got the ax. Yeah. Hey, going back to, uh, to, to Pittsburgh when you were an assistant there, like, was it hard for you as a, as a young coach in the league to approach some of these like already superstars and in, in, in order to communicate to them as an assistant would have to? Yeah, that's a great question, Paul. Um, we were fortunate because our older guys were Joey Mullen who was tremendous hockey hall of famer, Brian Trottier, who has spent a lot of time with Gordy Roberts, who was outstanding. Um, those were most of our older guys and they were great. And Yuri Herdino, who we got in a trade to help Yarmer Yager, um, who did, whose English wasn't great at the time, but the older guys were phenomenal because you could sit with them and talk to them and you didn't have to defend your turf. They knew you were trying to help them. So you make these tapes and you'd show them, here's what we got. And what do you think? And rather than tell them what you want them to do, feel out what they think they need to do. And so I, I thought that was really good, but I learned a lot being a young coach there. Absolutely. Then you made the move from TSN to um, NBC. Were you fired up to, to be working in the States? Uh, I couldn't believe the opportunity. I was so grateful to Dick Ebersol and Ken Shanzer, but in particular, Sam Flood, who's still there today. Um, Sam really helped create the inside the glass position. That was his vision. And I'll never forget at the 04 final between Calgary and Tampa, Sam came up to me uh, on the set. It was Bob McKenzie, Gordon Miller, and I working for TSN. And he said, do you think you could broadcast a game from between the benches? I said, I know I can, but there's no way the league will ever allow it. Not a chance. And he says, if you think you can do it, you got the job. But um, I'm just telling you, we're going to get this done. Then we had the lockout, and then the next year we had it, and that's when I started, and that's when Inside the Glass started. So did J- did Jelena score that goal in Game Six? Did Calgary question. have won that in Six? The, the photo op sure looks like it, Paul. But again, I can't tell because I can't tell from the picture. But it sure Flames looks ha- like it. Flames fans are going to hate your guts for not for not admitting <laughs> that was in. It hit that little area in between. I think it crossed the line. It sure did. But blame hockey operations. Don't blame me. Okay. <laughs> Are you on social media at all, Pia? No, I never will be. It's fa- uh, too many fake accounts, no interest in it. I've, I watch too much tape. Um, my day usually starts at 530 in the morning, usually finishes at about 1230, 1 o'clock at night. Um, I'm either watching NHL games, I'm watching junior games, I'm watching college games. I'm at practices. I try to help train kids. So I don't have time for that. I really don't. You're, you're watching games all day, every day. Pretty all much. leagues, all yeah. leagues. Yeah. Wow. I think one of the most important days of any NHL season is the draft. And your partner, Biz, was part of the best draft in the history of the National Hockey League. You're Coach welcome, Wit. And if you look at the players that were taken in the 03 draft, and I'll give you an example. Um, look where Corey Crawford was taken. Look where Patrice Bergeron was taken. Look where Shane Weber was taken. Look where David Backus was taken. You know, you go down the line. Look where Corey Perry was taken. Mike Richards. It's just, it's a murderer's row of players. The o, Joe Pavelski was 205th in the 03 draft, right? 
Yeah, that's worked out all right. He's the highest scoring American born player ever for playoff goals. Joe Pavelski, 205th pick in this is draft in 03. What do you make of the one they had to do basically via, via zoom this year? Uh, it was, it's probably, I would say, cause my son uh, is, it would have been eligible for this draft the 2020 will be eligible for next year. Uh, I thought the 2020 draft was the next best since so three. This is an outstanding draft. Uh, Ottawa and Montreal really stole the day. Ottawa did a phenomenal job. So did Montreal. Those teams are set up for five to seven year runs. They really are. Um, you, you, tremendous draft. Great draft. You've been uh, doing the draft forever. I mean, in the playoffs, all this, everyone sees you constantly throughout NHL seasons. But after the draft or at the draft, you know, you're having to dissect picks. You're having to talk about certain guys who maybe you know things about. Like, have you ever said things that have really pissed people off about a guy, whether it's dogging his pick or where he was picked, you know, where, where how he plays? Like, how has it gone on with criticism from other people around the league when you're around the game for 25 years? Great question and fair. Thank you. Uh, probably the one that got me in the most trouble was when the New York Islanders took Robert Nielsen ahead of Zach Parisi. And that was in Nashville. That was part of the 03 draft. And um, I'll, I'll be straight up with you. Uh, I said that now you know why some teams lose all the time and why some teams win all the time. And, uh, you know, that wasn't Robert Nielsen's fault that he was taking his father, Kent, a friend of mine. His father was an amazing player in the NHL, Kent Nielsen. But uh, it was a bad pick. And the Devils actually traded up to get Zach Parisi. So you knew right away that was a real smart pick by Lou. And you can't even compare it. So the next day, this is the story, right? The next day I got on the plane and there was Mike Milbury. And he wanted to fight me in the first class section of the plane. Like, what happened? He, like so, he's going at you, and you're 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 he saying you don't want to go. The, yeah, eyeball me and giving me the dirty look, and you know I gotta give Mike credit. He's drafted some real good players too, like Zdeno Chara. People yeah, they traded Mike him. Milbury's the guy that drafted Zdeno Chara. I mean, you can go down and look. Mike's had some pretty good draft records. He really has, but they missed on Robert Nielsen. A uh, quick Robert Nielsen story. I've told this one before. The player you mentioned, oh, this guy was so skilled. But, yeah, against Parisi, no question. You're right on that one. But he would be so tired before games in Edmonton sometimes that I sit next to him or right near him in the room, and after <laughs> after warm-ups, he'd be sitting there going, wake up, come on, wake up, and he's slapping his legs down him to try to wake up. So that kid cracked me up. He could play. You know, he had serious talent. You know, serious the one skill. thing – this, the one thing that I really like about Witt is he played with a lot of good players like you did, but I think one of the most underrated ones might have been Ryan Nugent Hopkins. Would he be, Ryan? Yeah, he. that guy's awesome. I mean, I, I don't – like you could kind of tell I don't think he'd ever be a 100-point guy, although – he was so good. I shouldn't even say that. He's so nifty with the puck, and he's so good defensively that there's a reason Edmonton's had the growing pains. You talk about what's going on, but that's not a guy you want to get rid of if, if you're an Oilers fan. I don't think anyone really ever has, or they shouldn't have. No, he's a multidimensional weapon. What blows me away is he can play center, he can play wing. With Kyle Turris going there now, they're starting to insulate their forward position, and I know you guys are probably having different selections who's the best player in the league. McDavid's probably the best player off the rush in the league. And Nathan McKinnon's probably the best power player in the league. But that Leon Dreisaitl's pretty damn good, too. I mean, you look at how good Edmonton's forwards are. It's pretty scary. What do you think of the Yotes? I know that uh, your name was popping up for this job. What would you have? Uh, what would you be doing differently? Uh, I don't know if that's fair for me to say, Biz, but I would say this is that uh, they've got a lot of heavy lifting to do. They yeah. put themselves in this salary cap purgatory. They're trying to clean that up. I respect that. They've got a new ownership group that's trying to stimulate some energy in their community. I think Billy Armstrong go in there and do a nice job coming out of St. Louis. Um, you know, obviously they had a little bit of a fumble at the draft this year. They're going to have to fix that. But this is probably a four to six year retooling. It's going to take some time for them to get it going there. No question. Yeah, well, I know we you want to bring. Oh, oh sorry. sorry. Go ahead. All right. No, go I was, ahead, it was with the coyotes, not necessarily about them, but your analytics quote raised some eyebrows, not on this show, but in other quarters. Did you get any uh, tersely worded emails from the analytics community? All or did oh, it just I, kind I, of blow I, over? I don't care. The truth of the matter is, when I watch the Tampa Bay Lightning play this year, and I'm watching Yanni Gord, and I'm watching Blake Coleman, uh, and I'm watching their grinding guys get after it, um, I'd like to see their analytic equation. I can tell you another thing, too. In 2011, when the Boston Bruins won the Stanley Cup and they had to win a game seven on the road, Danny Paye, Gregory Campbell, and Sean Thornton delivered the goods. I'd like to see where their analytic numbers were and their courses were. 
And ask the Tampa Bay uh, baseball team if they'd like a redo on uh, whether they pull their pitcher or not based on analytics uh, versus the L.A. Dodgers. So that's where I stand. So, what, so what did you make of the whole Chica situation leaving? I mean, that was kind of a shock to everyone. I'm sure you guys had an opinion on that as well. I, I didn't because I didn't know John that well. Um, I'm really bullish on Rick Tockett. I think Rick Tockett and Phil Housley are two of the better coaches in the league. I really mean that. And I think they're really going to help Arizona. I was surprised John McClain didn't stay on that staff. I, I watched that staff coach in Edmonton and I did a bunch of their games over the last couple of years. And uh, I think the coaching staff is one of the real strengths of the Coyotes biz. Uh, but I didn't know John Chica very well at all. So I really couldn't have okay. anything on him. All right, we'll delete that question. The reason <laughs> this is just looking for stir the pot a little bit. I respect uh, that, yeah. but uh, drag into the mud. Let's go. <laughs> Do I get in the mud, Pierre? Let's go, buddy. You gotta roll around. Yeah. <laughs> When's the you earliest just, you think we're gonna have hockey back, Pierre? Uh, if we can get a vaccine and it can get distributed properly, probably sooner rather than later. But it's great to see that the Big Ten's going to start on November 13th and 14th. I'm really excited for those games. And it's great to see that Hockey East is going to start at the end of November and that there's going to be a bubble in Grand Forks, North Dakota, and Omanaha, Nebraska, so we can get some hockey going out west. Uh, the BC Junior League is playing right now, which is exciting. So is the Alberta Junior Hockey League. I would say NHL is probably looking anywhere from January 15th to February the 1st, I would hope. I mean, that's what I'm hoping. What about no hitting in the O? What do you think about that? You know what, Ryan? I watch a lot of games, as you know, and and one of the things I'm seeing in the BC Junior League, which I think is really uh, cutting edge, what they do is they allow you to engage in a hit. But once a scrum situation ensues on the boards or in the goal crease, they'll blow the whistle after about one Mississippi, almost two seconds. And then you have to disengage and the face-off comes. But if you continue to engage, they'll give you a 10-minute misconduct. They won't make you shorthanded, but they'll give you a 10-minute misconduct. I, but I can tell you, there's some hits, some big open ice hits too in that league. But it's when it gets into confined areas, Ryan, is when they really blow it dead. So I think they can make that transition, but they're going to have to figure out how they're going to do it along the boards. That's the one thing. It sounds like it's trending towards – actually being a major if you breathe on someone <laughs> that was back well, in the day I, five minutes well, at least fighting will get to stay in they'll be worrying about the breathing too much <laughs> you know this is the other thing too in, in bc they started with half shields when the season started uh, and after the first week and they put full bubbles on all the players oh jeez. so oh, i know it's goodness. a little bit different it's like when you played college right Little yeah, bean the pot, bird, the old bird, the old Ooh. bird cage, Little the old bird pot. cage. It'll be like American Gladiators when you got to jump in that ball and just fucking roll around to score goals. <laughs> exactly, like fucking hamster wheel, right, Pierre? Pierre, is, are things getting a little soft for your liking as far as a league standpoint? I know the, you know, the concussion issues came up, but you know, sometimes you see these borderline hits and they're slowing them down, and you're like, holy fuck, let the guys play a little bit. I think they need to let them play. When I watch Barkley, Goodrow, Blake Coleman, Yanni Gord, I talked about them before, Paul, how they can influence a game. Those guys are really important. Um, I think the one thing, though, and I'll say this in defense of Ryan, it became real hard when it became zero tolerance and obstruction and no red line on defensemen. And I think like quarterbacks, defensemen need to be protected a little bit. So I'd like to see just a little bit of a hold up. But I would tell you one thing. When Ryan Reeves is breathing down your neck and he hits you, it hurts. It hurts. Like there are guys in the league that when they hit you, it hurt you. So there's some there's some big guys that are big physical presences out there. But is it as rough as when you played? I'd say no, it's not. Yeah. Well, re- recently retired uh, legend Doc Emmerich. I mean, you guys you guys teamed up for a long time. Um, you got to talk a little bit about him right when you met him, like and his preparation. But were you guys going out to dinner on the road? I mean, you guys good friends away from the arena. How was your relationship? And what did you think about him saying goodbye? Some of the best times I worked with Doc were between uh, 2 o'clock in the afternoon and 5 o'clock at night because we'd be sitting in the green room at the rink just by ourselves preparing our notes and talking about different hockey scenarios. And his mind is just like a steel trap, and it's phenomenal. He's the ultimate wordsmith. He was an amazing partner. Uh, worked with him for 14 years, did Olympics with him in Torino, Italy, Vancouver, Sochi, uh, and even London at the Summer Olympics. We did water polo together. Um just a phenomenal human being uh, learned so much from him in terms of how to prepare for games and, and create notes on, on different players and, and storylines. And, you know, uh, he's just, he's the King. He's the, he, there's only, I think there'll only be one other broadcaster in hockey that could be comparable to him and it would be Danny Gallivan. 
I really mean that. Not Bob Cole? Bob was great. Bob was great. For, and Bob had the longevity over 80 years of age. But, you know, Doc did teams. Doc did, Doc did a lot. Doc did teams. Doc did national. Same for Danny. Danny did Montreal forever, and he did the national forever. You know, Bob was just on the national side, so a little bit different. You did water polo? I did. I've done water polo at uh, London, Rio, and I was supposed to be in Tokyo last summer. How did summer. that happen? Busy's uh, like, I mean, and that's Katrina Yekopov <laughs> out of the Moscow Academy of the Water Polo Junior League, coached you know by Arasov <laughs> Nakarov. <laughs> what's amazing oh. about water polo, how similar it is to hockey and how great the American women are. The American women are off the charts good. They are off the charts good. I'm just telling you. And um, probably I would say on a women's water polo team, I'd say 80% of them are major hockey fans, major, major hockey fans. Yep. Well, the, 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 that sport is impossible. Savage. It's impossible it's, because it's, you're yeah. actually like getting physical in the pool and you're trying to tread water. Uh, RA would be done after one shift. Done. <laughs> what, one of the coolest things is going to watch the men train from the Eastern Bloc countries, the former Eastern Bloc countries. So watching the Serbians or watching the Montenegro players or watching the players uh, from Croatia, they take these 25 pound um, weight balls, medicine balls, medicine balls. And the guys are in the pool in the deep end. And the coach is like launching at their heads. They got to catch it without touching the bottom and throw it back. And they're doing this for like two and three minutes at a time. It's, it's amazing to watch them condition themselves. It really is. Yeah, I want to ask about the referee. And I, I thought it was pretty decent in this year's playoffs. I thought they called it sort of regular season style, but they've struggled the last couple of years. Do you think there are any flaws in the process from bringing guys up to the NHL? Maybe too, too many, I don't know, uh, nepotism, political politics, any of that stuff? No, you know, one of the best things that happened for me in the bubble this year, I lived with all the Tim officials. Hortons. What's that? Oh, I said Tim Hortons. Tim Hortons was free. Yeah. It was good. Yeah, it was good. That was one of the things. But uh, I lived with the officials for nine weeks. And I got to train with the officials every day, got to see how professional they were. I knew them all facially, but I didn't know them as people because you just, you don't run with them. You're in the city, you're out of the city, you're doing the game, you leave the game, they stay at one hotel, you stay at another but I got to spend time nine weeks with a lot of these guys and I respect their professionalism. I respect how they carry themselves. Some of them are former prison guards. Some of them are former undercover policemen. Some of them are just walk the beat kind of policemen. I mean, just phenomenal guys. I respect them so much. And I think this year's playoff was phenomenal. I, I thought the officials were just off the charts good in the playoffs this year. And just to clarify, I'm not picking on the refs. I know they have a tough job and they do a great job. It's, it's more about McCall, the process. West McCauley's the best young official. Chris Rooney's right up there. He didn't make the final, but there, there are a whack of really good young officials coming along. Really, really good officials. One other thing I want to ask, what about the Hockey Hall of Fame process? You're a part of uh, that committee as well, right? I'll never forget three years ago when Lanny McDonald called me. I thought it was a gag. I was like, are you serious? Are you putting me on? Is this like a candid camera thing? And he goes, no, Pierre, it's Lanny. I'm being serious. You've been nominated and we'd like to have you on the Hall of Fame selection committee. I'm like, I'm in. Where do I sign up? And I sent him a long note just to make sure it wasn't a gag. And he sent one back to me. And I'll never forget the first meeting. Um, it's an amazing thing to be a part of. Lanny and John Davidson do such an amazing job running it. Um, the people on the committee, their process of being prepared is just amazing. And the debates are phenomenal. They really are. And uh, you can learn so much in those meetings. It's great. I'm just so proud to be part of that committee. Other than that, what were you, uh, what were you doing inside the bubble? I mean, I'd imagine that was a tough experience being away from the family that long. That, that was one of the most difficult things I've ever done, Paul, in my career. I'll be honest with you. Um, the best part about it was hanging with the referees, training every day, um, spending a lot of time with the official, not officials from the league, but general managers or coaches or spending time at practice. Uh, working with Kenny Albert and Johnny Forslund was phenomenal. Those guys were great. Um, so, you know, again, I was grateful for the friendships that I made and the people that I knew over time, but it was a different experience. And, and I'm not sure it could ever be replicated as well as, as it was in Toronto and Edmonton. I, I, rec I realized what the players went through and I respect them so much. Unless you were through it, you have no idea how hard it was. It was amazingly difficult. I actually want to jump back to the Hall of Fame for a second. I'm one of these guys who's probably been critical about it. And I know it's not easy to whittle down that list and you got guys on it for a long time, but 
uh, does it not skew a little too Canadian at times? And I mean, we've got Europeans who get shut out guys on the States who don't get in for a long time. And then, you know, 18, 20 years, a guy gets in who wasn't good enough for 18 years. And all of a sudden he gets in now. How no, and why does that happen? No, I don't think it skews American, Canadian, European at all. I think it skews with the best presentations. And I'll give you an example. Uh, not this past spring, but the spring before Jerry York, the legendary coach out of Watertown, Massachusetts, uh, who started his career at Clarkson University, goes to Bowling Green, ends up, you know, still coaching at Boston College. He's a dear friend of mine. Jerry York's in the Hockey Hall of Fame. And trust me when I tell you, he had been nominated before and he didn't get in. Um, so I just look at that. I look at Joey Mullen getting in. Um, you know, I think they're going to be a whack of U.S. Uh, women Olympians that are going to get in pretty soon here. So, no, I don't think it's skews towards Canada. I, I think it's really balanced. And I'll tell you what, when some of the Europeans we have and Russians we have on the committee – you should hear how they fight for their countrymen and, and their uh, their domain. No, about, so no, it's really it's an awesome experience. What about Mogilny though? Mogilny just screams Hall of Famer to me. Well, you know what? There's been some interesting discussion about Alexander. Okay. There have been he's you know there's only so much I can say, Ryan. I can't say too much. It's a very difficult. I'll get that community. truth serum. I'll get that truth serum in you. The pink Whitney, yeah. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Now, you had Pro- you had Pronger and Hartford. Did you think you'd end up in the Hall of Fame when you had him then? Hundred um, percent. I'll give you a story that probably hasn't been out there. I'll never forget after we drafted uh, Chris, and this was Brian Burke that did, and Brian did a masterful job at the draft in Quebec to organize it so that it was a three-way deal with San Jose, Calgary, and Hartford. And eventually we ended up getting San Jose's second pick overall. And we gave them the fifth pick overall, I think, or the sixth, if I it's what fifth or sixth, but we, there were players involved too. Uh, Makarov was one of the players that was involved in that deal. But anyways, to make a long story short, we got Pronger and Brian left to go to work for the league. And I was sitting in the coach's office with Paul Holmgren and Pierre Page from the Quebec Nordiques call. And they were in our division, the old Adams division. He said, uh, would you be interested in trading Chris Pronger? Because we couldn't get him signed at that point. We're like, not a chance. And I won't tell you some of the names he threw on the table to us. But we were like, whoa, that's really, (laughs) that's appetizing. We may have to think about this, but we never did it. And I remember after we signed him, uh, I was talking to Patrick Morris and Donnie Meehan, who represented Chris. And I remember saying, He's going to get in the Hall of Fame. I mean, it's just a matter of whether he can stay healthy enough. That's how good he was. You knew right away. Because he's Canadian too, so. <laughs> I don't know if he still is. He's, I think he's a dual citizen now. There you go. Sorry, that was a layup. <laughs> um, I, this is, I know numbers aside, this is a question I have to ask people. Who, who's a better passer, Adam Oates or Wayne Gretzky? I know it might sound stupid to people, but. No, they were really different. Gretz was really good at creating separation for himself but he could hold the puck longer in the neutral zone. And if you broke down enough tape on Adam, Adam was a right-hand shot that used to attack your right defense or come down the left wing because he was so good on his backhand. And he really liked to do that. So what we would always do from Pittsburgh's perspective, especially in the old Boston Garden where it was smaller, we'd always attack with our left defenseman and try to pinch him off down that side to take away his time and space. Remember the red line was in, so our defense could really step up and cheat down on him. And we would lock that lane with a left winger. So uh, I would say Gretzky was still a bit better passer, but I'll tell you what, Oates was phenomenal on his back end. He had that little short blade, and he was really, really good with it, boy. He was excellent at it. I think we've brought this up a few times on the pod about the Pittsburgh days and how they vetoed uh, Scotty Bowman out of practice. Now, obviously, you were around for that. Had you ever seen anything like that in your life? And what did you guys do as assistants? Well, I'll never forget the day that it happened. Um, we were in Calgary. We were staying at the Marriott Hotel in downtown Calgary, and we were there two days before our game. And uh, I got a call to go up to the general manager's office at the time. It was a suite, but his office on the road. It was Craig Patrick, and uh, Craig just said, uh, Scotty's not going on the ice anymore for practice, and you guys will run it, and Pierre, you just be the guy with the whistle. So that's how we did it for the whole year. And uh, I'll tell you one thing. He may not have been on the ice for practice, but that's his team. He ran that team, Scotty Bowman. He was unbelievable. And on the bench, he won us a a first-round series against Washington. We were down three games to one in that series. We had to win games five and seven on the road, Biz. And it was all because of Bowman and his brilliance and Mario Lemieux and his eloquence meeting with the players. And it was Scotty that turned him loose with the players. It was a phenomenal, phenomenal thing. And uh, it just showed you how intelligent Scotty Bowman was at the time and still is. He's 86 years old right now, Biz. And he could still coach an NHL team. I'm telling you right now. Unbelievable. 
So what they, did they just, couldn't handle? They couldn't handle his mean streak nowadays, Pierre. What do you mean? No, you know one of the best parts about him, right, is he changed with the times. If you talk to the players that he coached at St. Louis in the late '60s, and then talk to his players that he coached in Montreal in nine, from through the '70s, but until his last year, 1979, when they beat the Rangers in the Stanley Cup final, or talk to his players in Buffalo through the '80s, or talk to his Pittsburgh and Detroit players in the '90s and 2000s. They'll, tell, they'll all tell you the same thing. They'll tell you he was a winning coach, but his atmosphere around the team was different in every single era. It was unbelievable how he changed with the times. Um, you're a guy who's, like you said, you're watching games, but you're also doing radio hits or on TV. How many radio hits are you doing a week? Because I see you on every station in, in, in every city I'm in. Um, I do about, uh, let's see, Ottawa, Montreal, Toronto, NHL, uh, Vancouver and Pittsburgh. So I, you know, a lot. That's Montreal every week, huh? Ottawa, Montreal and Ottawa are every day, and they've been that way for over 20 years. you got to have ever, some you, sort of escape. Like, what, what do you do besides hockey? There's got to be something. Uh, I like to golf. That's it. I like to golf a lot. I like to be a dad, too, Biz. You know what? Being a dad's a cool thing. Um, so I, I like to watch my daughter row. I like to help my son train or my daughter train. I like being a dad too. It's a neat thing. I like do you ever have the, the times, because you're talking about the entire league, I know I do, where it's like, oh boy, I, I don't know that much about that team right now. Or are you able to just be grinded in and into all 31? I think you try to grind it in all 31 and you try to, you know, one of the ways I start my day is you break down uh, depth charts of different organizations. That's how I usually start my day. And, nice uh, scone and some depth charts. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how I try to start my day, Ryan. And uh, I watch, like I said, I watch a ton of games. I watch one of the best things that's ever happened to hockey is hockey TV. Hockey TV is awesome. It's really good. So if you want it and you want to watch a lot of games, get hockey TV. It's a great tool. Pia, will, will we see Mike Babcock behind an NHL bench again? And if so, when? Oh, I think so. Mike's a tremendous coach. Uh, and I think Mike learned a lot. One of the best talks I ever had with a f- coach that got fired was Ken Hitchcock. And he's been fired more than once. And Ken's one of the better coaches you've had in the league over the last 25 years. I'll tell you that. And one of the things that Ken told me that I really respected is when you get fired, you have to have this discussion with yourself and you have to look in the mirror. What'd you do right? What'd you do wrong? What can you make better? And what do you really need to focus in on going forward? And if you have that honest conversation with yourself, I think you become a better coach because you learn. And I think Mike has had that conversation with himself. Uh, I've been around Mike at the Vancouver Olympics, the Sochi Olympics, obviously the Stanley Cup finals with played in 08 when they lost to Detroit and, and Paul, you know that as well. And, and then obviously 09 when he won in Detroit. And um, so I've been around Babs for a lot of big moments and he's a tremendous coach. And I, I do think he'll be back. I do. I know we don't know when it's going to stop, but whenever it does, do you have a potential Cinderella for the next season? Those New York Rangers are going to be good. Um, long-term, I think Ottawa is going to be really good. Uh, Ottawa, Ottawa Senators have really done a nice job in terms of stockpiling young talent. They were really aggressive, I thought, in free agency this year. They've developed uh, – they've got a real good coach down in Belleville, uh, Trent Mann, who's done some really good things with their program down there. I think Ottawa's a team to watch long-term. But Cinderella this year, Vancouver, man, I'm telling you, I know they lost Tanev and I, and I know they lost Markstrom, but I would tell you getting Nate Schmidt was huge for them. Getting Holtby was huge for them. Thatcher Demko is a real deal. I know Whitney doesn't like him because he went to BC, yeah. <laughs> which would be you guy. But I'll just tell you, Vancouver is going to be really dangerous, really, really dangerous. I got one fly. It's a, it's a more of a, a quiz. Toronto forward, Jimmy Vesey, second generation NHL. Where did his dad, Big Jim, go to high school? Uh, I think he went, did he go to St. John's Prep? Or did nope. he go to or, uh, Archbishop Williams? I stumped Pierre. <laughs> oh, there you go. But I, here's one for you. Ask him who won in the 1986 ECAC final between Merrimack and Babson. He was on the Merrimack team. I was yeah. coaching at Babson. I know who won. Big Jim knows who won too. We did talk on big, that one. Yeah, Big Jim put them on the map. Nobody big, really knew I'll tell who that was. Big Jimmy Vesey was an amazing player. He scouts for Toronto right now, and he he's an outstanding hockey man. I'll tell you what. I go to all these prep school games in Boston when I'm around with watching the ISL where you used to play. And Jimmy Vesey's at all those games. He, he's a phenomenal, he's phenomenal the best. hockey guy. Great he's hockey. the best. Chris, Christopher Columbus alumni, by the there way. There you go. All of Charlestown guy. There you go. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> 
not, not to be a little Debbie Downer, but I think it, you took a step back this year on NBC's team. You've been doing it forever. And then in the finals, I believe it was Brian Boucher. You're still, you're still on with the team. But was it hard getting that news or how did that all go down? I don't even know. You maybe have wanted it. No, it's just one of those things where you're part of the team and things change. And yep. I was doing the West and Brian was doing the East and he was doing it mostly with Eddie Olchuk and Doc Emmerich. And I was out West. Uh, I've been out West the last two years and it's been great. It's been awesome. So when you're part of the team, you take the role that the GM gives yep. you. If you don't want yep. to be part of the team, don't take the role. Exactly. So, and, and you know, you're, you're not old by any means. Do you know how long you want to do this? Or you just kind of take it year by year? As long as they want me to keep doing yeah, it. Yeah, so you I like making that money, you know, Pierre. I, you like getting that bag. I like, I like being in the rink, man. I just like being at the rink. And um, you know what? At some point, maybe I'll go back and work. I don't know. But this has been an amazing ride, and I love doing it. I really do. Yeah, like oh, this, uh, this center, we occasionally see a name pop up in certain columnists and certain paragraphs. Well, how come, how come it sporadically pops up every time there's a job open? Do you think like GMs are leaking this stuff to writers or are they just pulling out of thin air? Why, no, why do you think your name pops up? A sometimes lot? owners do it too, you know, um, trial balloons to see whether they want it or not. You know, there's, there's lots of reasons why, but I, I don't know. I take it as a compliment. And the one thing I can tell you, and this is for the young hockey people out there, Anytime you get asked to interview, and if you prepare properly for the interview, it makes you better at whatever job you have. Um, so any interview opportunity that you get, take it. Take it. It's not a knock on your employer that you currently have. It'll only make you better in the job that you're doing. So if you really do a severe breakdown and a deep dive on a team that offers you or asks you to be a GM candidate, do a deep dive on that team, and you'll be fascinated how much you can learn that maybe you wouldn't have learned before. That's awesome. Well, Pierre, we thank you for coming on, man. We'll get you on again as well. And uh, yeah, fucking uh, keep going. I can't believe how big you guys have become. And I got to tell you this, I'm so proud of both of you, but the biggest thing, and this is all the young kids that I see in the rinks, everybody's listening to Spit and Chicklets. Everybody. Thanks a lot, Pierre. Thanks so much for joining us. Take care. It's a pleasure being with you. Take care. Thank you. Likewise. Just want to send a huge thanks to Pierre Maguire for coming on with us. Uh, I know a lot of people are asking for us to bring him on for a while, and he didn't disappoint. Uh, Whether you agree, disagree, uh, indifferent, uh, I thought it was a highly entertaining interview, and uh, hopefully you folks enjoyed it as much as we did doing it. First off, uh, we want to also mention most guys have tried different ways to last longer. But as boring as it is, thinking about CBAs and MOUs and force majeures don't always cut it. Well, the folks at Roman, an online men's health company, are changing the game with Roman Swipes, the secret to longer-lasting sex. Roman Swipes are a clinically proven way to last longer in bed. They're effective, easy to use, and fast-acting, and they don't require a prescription. That's the best part. Roman can ship swipes to you in discreet, unmarked packaging, and each swipes packet is small enough to hide in your wallet for whenever you need it. They're super easy to use. You just take the swipes out of the packet, Swipe it on, let it dry, and you're good to get to good to go. That's it. So go to getroman.com slash chicklets. You get your first month of swipes for just five dollars when you choose a monthly plan. It's money well spent. One more time, that's getroman.com slash chicklets. Check that hey, stuff out, boys. It works. Boys, uh I heard. Can I can I play you my my buddy Gary's imitation of of RA opening up the show and see what? Oh my think? goodness! You called me one time, and you had him do it live. I legit thought I was listening to a recording of RA. All right, boys, uh, let's have a good show, guys. Three, two, one. Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode three hundred and four, Spit and Chicklets, presented by Pink Whitney from our friends at New Amsterdam Vodka here in the Barstool Sports Podcast family. Let's check in with the boys. Let's throw it to Mikey G down in New York City. How's everything in New York, Mikey? <laughs> I think it's pretty fucking good, to be honest. Unbelievable. Uh, he's got Unbelievable. the script Gary in Philly. Shout out Gary. Oh, uh, shit. Gary. Well, one of the big drops that happened uh, since we've been gone, Adidas, they dropped their reverse retro jerseys. Uh, I blogged about it on Boston. Got a little bit of grief for it. I was having a little tongue-in-cheek fun. Uh, I thought personally, I thought some of the shirts were ones we've seen before. Like I, I wrote a bunch of teams like Oilers, Flyers, Red Wings, Panthers. Those are like versions of shirts we've already seen. I know they, you know, changed the pipe in or the neck or whatever, but uh, I had some fun goofing on it. What, what was your take on these things? I I got to bring up something else. All right, before we get into them, Jeez. Keith Yandel. 
Did you get his message? Where did he, he send it to me? Oh, he said, I think he sent it to you on Instagram. I did not get it. No. So, all right. Like, I got questions for you. Keith was rattled. He's, he's pissed. He's pissed. Oh, no. He said that in your blog, you mentioned you were kind of shitting on the league for doing it and like saying something about making people spend their money. Was that true? Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. I said the NHL knows the quickest way to increase hockey re- related revenues to drop yet another uh, team jersey. Okay. So what he said to you and he said I had to ask you is uh, he wrote to you and said, what's the difference between that and you selling merch on bars on spitting chiclets? Nothing. I mean, it's all about revenue. We're all here to make make money. I mean, I was just, you know, I wasn't criticizing. I just said, hey, that okay, <laughs> if the okay. league needs to make some money. Criticizing. I think he thought you were criticizing. No, uh, no, no. Okay, no, it's all okay. it's all part of the game. I mean, everybody, we're all here to, you know, ultimately pay our bills at the end of the day. It, I just said, hey, the quickest way to do it is to drop these jerseys. Now, I think they already had them planned well in advance. But, yeah, I, and to be clear, I wasn't criticizing the, the design. I just thought some of the jerseys looked familiar. And if you were a fan of those teams, you could have gotten a jersey that looked very much like those already. That's all. I wasn't, like, really shitting on anybody there, I didn't think. So to hop into, into RA's defense, I felt like some teams didn't just – they like, didn't participate in the, in the group project. It's like the it Red was, Wings it, haven't had it bad enough. Well, okay, so okay, so to to their defense, they've been fairly traditional with their jersey, where they haven't changed it at all, really much throughout the years. Now, a team like the Islanders, the fact that they didn't go back to the Islander dude is fucking nuts. And then four days later, Herschel drops like a collaboration with the Islanders dude, where I'm like, Lou Lamorello is fucking trolling us all. Um, there's a few other examples of teams like you mentioned the Oilers where I feel like they didn't really go like, why wouldn't they have done that? To, like the oil drop or something that they changed throughout the course of, of time where like, listen, I'm not just pumping their tires. Cause I know there has, Oh, oh. now if you're not, if you're listening to this, Wit just showed up in oh, the throwback Pittsburgh. Overall, this is my old draft Jersey. Oh, two. You got to talk into the mic wit. How fresh is this jersey? It's unbelievable. I really like Pittsburgh. Some people were very critical of it, but I love when they do the 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 letters across like that. Kind of like how the Rangers used to do it. Um I, I thought I thought the Quebec Nordiques and Avalanche collaboration was awesome. Of course, I love the the Whalers one, so it's hard to really knock that one. And they changed up the colorway a little bit. But but all right, in a sense, with your comment as far as jacking up like or or trying to get the hockey related revenue going i felt like probably 10 of the teams where it was like that's all you could fucking think of this is supposed to be for fun and and supposed to be to like sell the game and some teams just did not do a very good job of it detroit was an example that people use to their defense very difficult given their circumstance as far as what they've done in the past some other teams did not have an excuse for this they did not other examples, RA, that you would use Dude. of teams who like needed to go outside the box a the little bit. Islanders. I said the Islanders when you went and put on your Pittsburgh jersey oh, as the prime sorry. example Jesus. of of not using that dude. Who else did you yeah. have? I I said wait, on the blog biz. I said um, what am I missing here? And I wrote Oilers, Rangers, Blackhawks, Predators, Red Wings, Panthers, Lightning, Maple Leafs, Devils, Islanders, Flames, and Flyers. And again, it's not the criticism of the jerseys. It's just that. You know, basically, it looked like someone put an assignment off to the last minute and then handed it an old draft with a few paragraphs moved around. That's the way I felt. And a few Jersey fans were like, oh, you don't like these, um, the, the Christmas crack colors? I'm like, no, I, I love the Jersey, the New Jersey Jersey with the green and red. But but you could have bought it, you know, three three months ago or three years ago. It's not like necessarily new. I, I, we're in agreement, Biz. They could have they could have tinkered a little more. Okay, I wasn't as critical Detroit's of New Jersey. Crack, Detroit- Detroit's practice jersey was by far and away the worst, though. I'm sorry if I missed that when I was getting my jersey on, my draft jersey. I, which ones did you guys pump their tire? Because I don't want to repeat, but can I give you my so top I'll, ones? So I'll go top five. I'll say King, I'll, I, and okay, I'll, I've changed it up a little bit throughout the, the whole launch. I would say Kings would be on it. I would say for sure the Coyotes would be on it, and that's not being biased. I actually really like the jerseys. Uh, the, the Nordique Avalanche one. Um, I'm going to hand it over to you before I give my last two. Whip. Yeah, I got no particular order. I got no particular order. The blues, 
definitely in my top five. I think those are sick. I just remember when, when Gretzky was on the team with those unis. I love those. I, I actually also couldn't agree more about, about the Quebec Nordiques, the avalanche. That's sick. Look, um, Man, I like I like the one I'm wearing because I think of Mario and I think of Yager and just dominating everyone in the early nine. Uh, this jersey was actually mid nineties, I guess, early to mid nineties. I wonder what year this is from. What year is it? All right, sorry. What year are they from? Or does it differ? Oh yeah, there was sometime in the nineties. Different. Yeah. So I got was... Pittsburgh sent to me. Jen, my girl Jen Bellano, thank you so much. I should know the exact year, but it was the day why it was born is when this jersey came. So I'm just putting it on for the first time. Florida's is awesome. Florida's is like when they went to the little, they got swept. They got swept the year 96 by Wa. I like the Uwe Krupp. Uwe, Uwe Krupp. Um, I like those. Those are, those are sick. And the other one that I wanted to shit on, the Canucks look like the team that's in the tournament that every team's going to beat 9 nothing. You know? That, see, they come in. The kids, half of them got rec specs on. The other half are studying and waiting for the games in between games. We're all playing mini hockey at McDonald's at the mall. So that jersey sucks. Um, the other one, Montreal's is sick. Montreal's you like the blue, is- eh? Oh, fuck. Montreal's is right up I, there. I, I, I put the Capitals in my top five. I like, the, I like the Capitals throwback one. And if I had to throw one other team in the mix... Wit, I think I think you've swayed my opinion on the on the Blues one, and I, I, I'll, oh, I'll yeah. give I'll give the Ducks credit on the fact that they went really different. I just yeah, felt Ducks personally is. it landed flat for me. It just I it, liked it. it. I, I think it'll look good on the guy once they're flying around. If their team's good and they're buzzing it, imagine that jersey just shit kicking you five nothing at the pond, like when they won it. The Yotes yeah. is awesome too. The Yotes is, is top the five Yotes, as well. I don't, I, I, I don't love the Yotes because the I don't know the purple. Although I like the Kings purple, uh, the Yotes is definitely like it's definitely like a modern look where I think they'll sell a ton of jerseys. The Mescal and Mutt. That's what I call them in the blog biz. The shark. The sharks have been wearing that jersey for twenty five years, guys. No, <laughs> that's I have exactly. like signed pictures of Mike Greer in that jersey. Like I, when, I thought biz. My favorite three top. Uh, with the Kings, I loved how they took the, the purple and gold and put it with the Gretzky era. Uh, the Coyotes, uh, I, I, I like that just because it's funky. Like they said, the mask on mud. And then the Sabres. I thought the Sabres were cool, man. They, they had that old Shogun logo that they used years ago, and they put it with the original colors. I thought that was really sharp. I thought those were the three top Fair ones enough. I liked. Fair enough. Yep. All right. 96-97. Right, well, could... That's Pittsburgh's jersey. 96-97 season. Yeah. All right. Well, I guess we can move on from this. We've yeah. uh, we've vented enough, but uh, some teams great job, others not so much. And uh, fans, we hope you guys enjoyed them. Well, at least the Canucks logo wasn't a, a picture of a, a groom booting his his grab ride in the face during their wedding dance. Shout out Adam Goddett. <laughs> oh, that was just so classic. Was she busted up? Did he hurt her? No, I, I think okay? she, I think she, yeah, she was fine. And she took it in good stride as you'd expect, but yeah, he was out there doing his uh, topless wedding lap dance for, for his new bride and try to swing his leg like a rocket and, and caught his, uh, his new old lady uh, right in the, right in the chops. Uh, she was fine. And it's funny. I, I, I remember I talked about when I did an autocorrect biz and I'd said something about cutting his hair. He thought I was goofing on him. And when I saw the video, I understood why, like he's got quite the fucking Caesar salad going right now. Yeah. He's got the flow. He had some tight hammies in those pants and uh, his, old lady, his old lady uh, had to get sent the uh, concussion protocol before throwing the bouquet. But uh, good to hear that everybody was all right. Hey, you know, the staff in Vancouver is like, oh, when's the last time that guy got a stretch in, though? Fuck, he can't even get <laughs> his doing head. The Bikram yoga yeah, with, he, uh... They're going to give him that stretching test that was the old school camp test. Remember, Biz? How many? How far can you reach? Yeah, and then you got to push the thing and it'll it'll measure it. Yeah, those... I was the master of getting enough knee off the ground to make it look like I was way more flexible than I was. You know, they're like, knee on the ground, knee stays flat. I was able to get this much every time. That's a, that's that's an that's a that's a big difference in that test. Speaking of fitness testing, Pittsburgh. When I first got there, who oh, who was who? Okay, so Johnny, who was, uh, John. Um, he, so he had one leg that was like two inches shorter than the other, and he had the, he had a two inch sole on his one shoe, and and it was uh, it was honor system fitness testing. He'd be like, yeah, just like go go do sit ups and let me know how many you did, and like you know all the veterans would be like, yeah, 120, 100. <laughs> and the, 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 was it not the biggest joke wit? It was the biggest joke of all time because I remember like, 
I remember you get, you know, you get the sit up with a push up test and you really start struggling and you be with a guy, you say like, dude, it doesn't matter. Just say, say what you want. <laughs> like, why are you stressing so hard, buddy? Just tell him 17. Oh my goodness. Yeah. It was, I remember it was... here when I found that out, I was like, that's the best thing because you, that was, there was teams you hear about like whole, like torts back in the day. I think that they, I think torts might add like five mile runs and no, then you had to 15, do... 15 laps. I think they do like 15 lap test. Fuck. We have to get a former ranger or light, whatever. He had a skating test. That was a sick joke. And I just, my, my test, my test was to see how many, numbers i could add on to my actual push-up yeah. number then 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 they te- some teams started getting a little bit crazy where remember we used to do the beep test off the ice where you had to you know get to the line and and then the, it would get quicker and quicker and i think when you got up to around 12 13 those were like the guys who had the best cardio well they transferred it onto the ice and then that was when it's things started getting a little bit too ridiculous and guys started blowing out their groins and training camps left right and center because it was just it was Stops too much guys guys were coming in in shape and then all of a sudden they were getting burnt out so uh, I don't know how we got to there, but uh, yeah, shout out to whose name was his name was Johnny. Yeah, but it's actually it was John Welday. He actually passed away in 2016, so that sucks. Well, hey, thanks that. for thanks for helping out the boys when you could, man. Fuck. Thanks a lot for what he did because he was a great guy. So I didn't know that 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 sucks, but still, thank you so much for those those uh, testings you gave us. You were a hell of a trainer. Everyone loved you for it. I, Biz, I remember you just mentioned uh, about Connects doing a little stretching a few minutes ago. Apparently, uh, uh, some of the Connects did some heavy duty stretching before they jumped on a helicopter, went all the way up to northern BC to find a random well, pond, lake, whatever, uh, to play a little shinny. That was one of the most gorgeous videos I've seen during this entire break. Yeah, Bradley Friesen. He he lives in Vancouver. Uh, I did the ice bucket challenge with him. He helped out big time. Of course, he's got the chopper. He does all these wild stunts. Check him out on Instagram. Uh, he, he goes up there with his bulldog all the time. And uh, sometimes they head up there, they find these sheets of ice on these like, you know, lakes in, in the middle of like all these high mountains up in the up in northern BC and then they'll land and then they'll shovel them off and they'll get a shinny game going and he decided you know considering that there's no hockey being played right now he reached out to a few Canucks him and a few other of the pilots went up there with them and uh and they had a great time they ended up getting a there was an article in the New York Times about it uh it's all over social media I believe uh um EP40 posted about it uh Thatcher Demko was up there with them and what what other players as well uh G Troy Statcher of the Red Wings was there as well so check it out. Where, I mean, where do be, they land the chopper biz? Uh, they try to find anything that's like flat and secure enough in order to do so. And so I mean, do they even I, do they even know how deep that is there, or is it just known it's that frozen? It doesn't matter. It's a I would imagine Brad's been doing it long enough where he knows where the secure areas are, and and uh, you know that's he's. Sick. He, he, I think he has to call in for some type of clearance at some point, but keep in mind, you're so far up in the mountains that the, those, those lakes are completely frozen. So he, he's done some pretty wild stuff on, on all of his uh, social media. So check him out on YouTube. Uh, he's, he's big on Reddit as well. So actually that, that whole ice bucket challenge we did for the ALS, um, the ALS uh, back in the day, um, it was an idea that we thought of when we were drinking at night and then we texted him and the next morning he was calling us off the hook. He's like, Hey, are we going to go do this? And we were like, uh, sure. Yeah, let's go. You did it and then we day? ended up going the next day when we were hung over <laughs> and we did the whole thing. So it was awesome. He ended up getting a professional camera to shoot it. And, uh, and the rest is history. I believe the video got over 10 million views and, you know, it created some awareness for it. So uh, shout out to Bradley Friesen and the rest of the boys for, uh, for getting it done. Yeah, got to be careful. You drop those choppers. Don't want another Jaws 2-like incident. Uh, speaking of crazy videos, Biz, how about the dude who saved his puppy from an alligator's mouth in the water, never lost his cigar? I mean, I know it wasn't a, obviously a 10-foot alligator, but he, he fucking saved his puppy and fucking never lost his cigar. Dude, all time, like not a hot video, just a man's man doing that shit, no? Yeah, it was the guy who gave me the shirt in Cabo. No, but th- th- this, <laughs> I, I want to, it looked like he was on a golf course and there was no hesitation. And it wasn't a huge alligator either. It was one of those smaller ones, but it was a puppy. I don't even, did it have teeth? I'm not even chirping. Like, could that thing actually hurt you? Could well, it hurt no, the puppy. It, but, but it, I know, it, but could it have hurt him? 
Yeah. Sorry, what, what, what would have been scary about it is considering there was yeah, those the little dog. ones, little gators in there, what, maybe there was bigger yeah. ones, but to no hesitation, he saw it get I snatched, know. dragged into the water. He jumped right in, kept a cigar in his mouth the whole time, clawed it out. And the, puppy, the puppy ended up r- running away. And uh, I'm sure he, uh, you know, he was, uh, he was celebrating that night with a few, few pints because he looked like he was uh, having a good time already. So if that very was biz, cl- hey, if that- if that was you with Finnegan, you'd just be like, Mr. Finnegan, bye bye. Oh, here's a story for you. So we had to, we brought him to Cabo. We thought we were going to be really? able to stay at, the, stay at the condo with him. And then all of a sudden we get there and the, the guy at the gate's like, yeah, no dogs. So Katie had to research. We had to find somebody who, like a kennel. Would fly take, him home? No, we, we, had, we had to keep him in a kennel there. But you luckily put him there in was, a Mexican kennel biz? No, there was a, she, she found this Canadian guy who lives oh. down there. He's like the, 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 the dog whisperer. So we ended up driving about 35 minutes away from where we were. And, and he took the dog for the whole week. And by the end of the time, he, he, he loved it, Did but you he go was, visit him at all? he was like the, no, he, cause, cause the dog whisperer was like, Hey, yeah. let him get relaxed into a setting yeah. here. He's going to fall in love with it. It's like, it's like a tranquil space. What do you, what do you, how would he you use doggy shrooms? He, he he was like the guy in along came Polly uh hippopotamus you know he's crushing my old lady while she while he was giving the walk through <laughs> the whole doggy compound but no he, so i don't know how we even got there what were we talking about uh the alligator taking the, the alligator and me saying that you just would have sang it mr finningham but i know you would have oh, gotten them oh and that 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 kind of dragged me into a different story but uh actually you can delete that girl gr- i don't even know why i started yapping off about that no, I like that shit, Biz. It's That's all right. Interesting. Honestly, Biz, I think that golf course could use a Simply Safe. There's almost always a rise in break ins during the holidays. It's why Simply Safe Home Security is having a huge holiday sale 40% off any Simply Safe system and a free security camera. Recently, US News and World Report called it the best home security of 2020. So whether you're traveling or staying put for the holidays, check out the 40% off plus free security camera deal before it ends this week. This thing is so easy to hook up. The equipment is top notch. I can't vouch for it enough. It won CNET editor's choice for home security and was the best of 2020 from Forbes and popular mechanics. The system has an arsenal of sensors and cameras that protect every inch of your home. You can set it up yourself in about 30 minutes. It's super easy. Even I did it. Plus, there's no contract, there's no hidden fees, and there's no installation costs. Then Simply Safe's security specialists take over. They monitor your home around the clock, and they're ready to send emergency help the moment there's an alarm. So get 40% off Simply Safe plus a free security camera today by visiting simplysafe.com. That's S I M P L I S A F E dot com slash chicklets, C H I C L E T S. But you got to hurry up. This deal expires on Friday. That's simplysafe.com slash chicklets. Simplysafe.com slash chicklets. And Biz, speaking of dogs, how about Hank and Rhea's dogs? Uh, their hammer. Their, their pepperoni mean, dick. That had to be the weirdest thing I've seen on the internet since we last met. If you're I, listening to this and you haven't seen Hank's dog's dick, who, who works for Barstool, it's... It, it's impossible to describe it on here. You just have to look at the picture. So if if you if you get a chance, go look at it. Now, it's not like that all the time. It's only when it gets hard, right? Uh, I would fucking I hope so. <laughs> it was like a bloody carrot. It was just so big. How is this dog's hose was, that? That's a situate boy, my boy. It was a, jo- it was a Joe carrot. <laughs> <laughs> that's a joe cranberry that was it was just so odd looking i mean it looked like a photoshop that a, a, a little peanut sized dog ha- has a penis that protrudes to that length and it's just so it was just weird looking we always talk about a little red lipstick on a dog but that was that like was horrify Rhea. giant Jeez. fucking no. cranberry it was it, it looked like a pepperette to me and it was long too it was long and greasy oh, uh, oh. Biz, we were talking about Cabo. You had some story down there. Some lady uh, hammering out calls, full blast. What, what no, was going on down there? I would imagine we don't have one single listener that would ever do this at a restaurant. So this is, um, I don't even know if we kept the story in about how the fact that we had to go get the, the guy from Along Came Paul to take the dog whisperer to take care of Finnegan. But we we dropped him off and then we had to go back two hours later to make sure he was going to be okay and be able to adapt to it. Well, in the meantime, we ended up going for a drink and we sit down at this bar and 
this lady makes a FaceTime call and she's like yelling oh, at her dude. phone no. right next to us. My girl's pretty chill. So it riled her up enough to where she got up and she had to do a lap to like decompress. To- oh, I would have been like, hey, fucking take it outside or put your headphones, even headphones in. You're listening. That would have been bad. You had to hear both sides. Yes. Oh, and that's fuck. That's trash. Here's the worst part. So after about three, four minutes of her being completely obnoxious, yelling at the screen of her phone and me looking around like, have I lost <laughs> my mind here? Am I the only person noticing this? She hangs up the call. And I'm like, okay, fair enough. Let's get back to just enjoying ourselves. She goes right through and scrolls down, calls somebody else. Then she proceeds to do it another two times. In the in the midst of this going on, I talk to the bartender. I call over the guy. I say, you got to get us a table like, out, out of this lady's way. This is fucking ridiculous. So finally, they end up moving us. And one of the other couples that was next to her at the bar came over. And they were like, that was 100% one of the most obnoxious things I've ever seen. So, folks, if you are listening to this podcast right now, if you have to take a phone call, Outside. make it make it short and sweet if you're going to stay there. If it goes longer than, let's say, 20 seconds and you're talking loudly and obnoxiously, leave the restaurant. Go handle your business outside. I could, I could not believe my eyes with. She banged out four FaceTime calls in the matter of about 15, That's 20 one of minutes. The tiest moves I've ever seen in my life or heard. Just, just absolute garbage. You can't be doing that. Yeah, you can't be ruining people's meals. People are fucking such inconsiderate trash too. Like you know, like, I've, been, I've been seeing, I've been a part of some great, great public holding the door, public, uh, uh, not you know what's the word niceness? That's terrible vocabulary. I need a courtesy. Thesaurus. Courtesy. I've been a part of some great ones lately. I've been really kind of stepping it up on my end. I've been trying to pay it forward. I'm holding a door. I'm holding four or five doors a day. And then all of a sudden it gets a smile. Thank you so much. No problem. How long are you holding it for? Like a, like a, I like see, a 10 step? I got, I got like a, I got a, I got a, I got a wide runway. I mean, a long runway. I'm giving, I'm giving you. Like to the point where you're like a Walmart greeter at now, this point. I'm also holding it no matter what. But if you give that little, like just that fake little, like I'm kind of hurrying up. Do you know the little like the quick yeah, oh, yeah. Hey, hey, you know, you're just you're just showing you appreciate it and you're gonna get the, that that even that even that warms my heart too. So I think that RA, I know what you're saying, but I'm trying to trying to do good on the other end. Yeah, that's all we can do is try to be better there every day. Uh this is uh one death we, we weren't able to acknowledge since uh, our last episode. I did give a little tribute to Alex Trebek, but Sean Connery passed away the uh, original James Bond, absolute legend of cinema. Um, seriously, from fucking fantastic quotes, The Untouchables, The Rock, all these fantastic movies he made. Uh, Biz, were you a, a big Sean Connery guy? Oh, yeah. I loved I loved him in um, The Rock. Uh, Rocha's always whine about he, trying their best winners go home and fuck the prom queen. Yeah, What's our, that from? That's from um, that movie. The Rock. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's when he's like drag on Nick, dragging Nicolas Cage under the... the the prison's like well system to try to get in there. Alcatraz, he's breaking up through the the vents. That movie was sick. Sean Connery was actually a guy, and all right, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but did he not just play the coolest badass in every movie? <laughs> like pretty much, yeah. If you're yeah. if you're if you're if you're that cool, where you're only playing that cool of a guy in the movies. You are next level in terms of like ballers. I, I think of James Bond as like the biggest pimp, absolute boss of, of what the sixties and seventies are right. Or even yeah, he the was, 80s. he was more like the baby boomers version of the, of James Bond. I don't say that like the way kids mean it nowadays, like basically guys, my father's age, he was the first James Bond. So I was actually more of a Roger Moore James Bond guy, just because of when I was born. But even after he stopped doing the Bond stuff, I mean, the Hunt for Red October, Indiana Jones, The Last Crusade, The Rock, The Untouchables, where he won his Oscar. Uh, he kind of was, in a, in a sense, playing himself, but he was Sean Connery who just brought this such a huge screen presence that you'd fucking sign up for it no matter what because he was so good at what he did. So Were there, were there any stories about him off screen? Was he always like a, a good guy to be around? They said he could be a he could be uh very intimidating. A he Scott, could, yeah, he man. can 
he could bitch some directors around if they, like, cause you know, most directors he had way more experience than, but they also said he was a gentleman about it, that like he, he would be firm about it. And he always had the movie or the art, art at, at, at his heart. So he was never doing it to be a dick. He was just doing it because he, he knew what to do. Yeah. He could be cantankerous and difficult at times, but most people who work with him said it was, it was a fantastic uh, career highlight to work with Sean Connery. All right. Speaking of career highlights, you guys dropped another sandbagger since we last met. That's hey, right. Biz. We didn't just drop one, Biz. We grabbed another W. That's right. And what's gone on since then is just so funny because, Biz, we almost blew that lead. So I've heard from a lot of people. I mean, let's be honest, too. I think I think if we if we premiered at on Tuesday at 8 p.m., by 8 a.m., we had over 100,000 views. Foreplay just released a golf video. The next morning, they had 15. It's like, we're a hockey podcast. They went to Australia. To, to, they went to Australia. Too. We went to, dude. We went to Dedham. <laughs> I mean, we're the hockey podcast, and our numbers, people are loving us. Watch, uh, love watching us play golf. Uh, they probably like who we're playing against a little more, but we're winning, and that's all that matters. And we got one more. Can we keep the streak alive? I'm talking so monotone because you have no clue what went on, but it was Keith Yandel and Kevin Hayes. Oh boy, that's all I'll say. I know as we far teased as, it. And as far as Colin White and uh, Woods are concerned, I thought that th- them calling me out for being a sandbagger and then me giving them back what six strokes on the back nine and still fucking pulling the win off that was wild. Mind you, they sent the marshal after us on the front nine, and yeah, and I, then I, I, <laughs> the, the 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 bank shot on seventeen. Don't even get me started. That was absolutely ridiculous. I don't think that should have counted. I thought we gave that to them way too quick. If you have not seen the latest Sandbagger, I suggest you check it out. We're going to continue to do these things. They are a blast. And I'll tell you what, for the first time in a long time, they get my competitive juices flowing. And That's I, why I, I play w- golf. It's all I have now. And I'm a competitive motherfucker, biz. You know it. I need to be in these matches. And when we're winning, it's way better than if we were losing. That Hayes... Stapleton match makes me want to puke. Yeah, that's that was a blunder in our success right now. We're currently three and one, and uh, looking forward to releasing the Kevin Hayes. And and one other kicker too is is wit. Uh, when you jump on there for the live viewing, oh, yeah. I think it's awesome. It's great fan interaction. We're going to continue to do that moving forward. We're going to give everybody a little bit more of a heads up before we drop the Yans and Hayes one. And uh, we're going to get we're going to hopefully get 10,000 people concurrently watching it, if that's even a word. Is that a word concurrently? concurrently? I don't know. At one, at one point, I think we had five grand watching it, Mikey. Yeah, we got up to five, five point nine at one point. Yeah, almost six, six grand. We're watching it during the live you know, broadcast where I'm on. I'm on the chat and I love maybe talking about something that's going on or maybe just chat with some of the scumbags in the chat. Um, I think that it's a blast for us to do. And I also, I also think that we're talking to some guys. I mean, it could be, it could be fun. We're getting other media guys involved players. It's it's, it should keep continue to grow. So if you haven't seen it, go check it out right now on spit and chickles YouTube page. We appreciate it. Well said and biz uh, it's concurrent. Anytime you get sentenced, you always want concurrent sen- sentences, not consecutive. Just FYI. If you ever go All to right, jail, well, my, my mind's in a pretzel right now because we've been going quite a while here. Yeah. Uh, fans. It's great to be back in the saddle. Yeah. Well, that'll wrap it up. It's been a huge uh, episode action packed for you. Uh, definitely overstuffed. Hopefully everybody enjoys it. Enjoy your week. Enjoy your weekend. And uh, on a personal level, I just want to say farewell to a, a dear family friend, Pookie Woods. Uh, you were the best. Everybody's going to miss you, pal. Atta boy, sorry for your loss. Have a great day, everyone. Peace.